I was 10 years old when I first met the being who would haunt me for the rest of my life. Growing up, my father spent long days away, toiling away at his construction job, giving me free reign of the house. He'd entrusted me with a key, which every morning before school, I'd slip under a flower pot by the front step and use to get in. My friends thought I was living every kid's dream, and in a way, I was. When I got home, I would either kick off my shoes at the front door and bounce off to go watch cartoons or go outside and play in the front lawn until the bright suburban days darkened into a misty orange haze. It was on that day when I found myself indoors watching reruns of my favourite cartoons when I felt a sudden presence on my bladder. Shifting the large bowl of popcorn off my lap, I headed upstairs to the bathroom. Just as I was turning a corner on the landing, I saw her. She was wearing what had once been a long white summer dress, now torn and smeared a reddish brown with colour. Her stomach seemed to have been scooped out, to the point a shaft of light from the window behind her shone through her exposed flesh, intestines trailing down past her knees like some macabre bridal train. Her hair fell over a pale face in ropey, dishevelled strands, almost completely obscuring it, pale limbs twitching at her sides as she blocked my way. There was something static about her presence, as if she was about to fade out of existence at any moment. Her head tilted up to look at me with a throaty groan. She wore the saddest expression I'd ever seen, that even now I find myself struggling to describe. It was as if she was seeing a whole world crumble around her. Of course, I responded the way any typical child would, by running screaming from my house and into the safety of a bemused next door neighbours who promptly called the cops. They searched every inch of the house, but they couldn't find any sign of a break-in. My hysterical state didn't do anything to aid their questions. I tried to describe what I'd seen to them, but my words came out as tangled, sobbing gibberish. My father was even less understanding when he arrived home from a long day to find blue flashing lights in the driveway and police officers swarming the house. Believing it to be a prank, he offered them a lengthy apology. After exhausting all other options, the police came to that conclusion too, and after giving a stern warning to me about the misuse of emergency services, they had left me to deal with the inevitable fallout. I had made a feeble attempt to explain what I'd seen to him, but he wasn't in the mood to hear it. He just sent me to bed after a few gruff, angry words which seemed to comprise most of our interactions back then. It was as if he couldn't stand me being around. In the end, I stopped trying to tell him. I knew he'd never believe me. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept thinking that the second I closed my eyes, I would feel her bony hands wrap around my ankles and drag me into the endless darkness beneath my bed. But as dawn peeked through my blinds and there was no sign of her, I found myself heaving a heavy sigh of relief. I resigned her to my nightmares, where she would stay for a very long time. As I shuffled out of my room in my pyjamas to go downstairs and get some breakfast, I found myself face to face with her, a few feet from where I'd originally seen her on the landing, just hovering there. I remember the steady pulse of my heart halting in my chest, the bleary-eyed ennui of the morning replaced by dry-mouthed terror, the kind that few people ever experience in their lives. It was to become a familiar feeling for the next few years. Whenever I seemed to turn, she was there. When I climbed up the stairs, she would always be waiting at the top, looking down at me. Her head would poke out from behind doorways, fingers coiled around the wooden frame, Soon, it wasn't just the house I saw her in anymore. From my seat in the school bus, I would see her staring out the front porch, not far from my stop. No matter where I was, she was there. Every Christmas, every birthday, just hovering out of my peripheral vision. There was no escape. As well as her, I found myself haunted by a single question. Why? Why me? 
I didn't understand why she chose to haunt me of all the billions of children in the world. What had I done wrong to deserve this? Surely there were worse kids out there who deserved something like this. If she knew the answers, they remained sealed away behind her silent lips. It was one night when I was 12, when I had been woken by a soft humming that filtered into my ears. It was a wordless melody I could almost swear I had heard before, but so far back that I couldn't remember anything else. Ragged fingernails encrusted with black, dried blood combed through my scalp. In my hazy state between consciousness and sleep, I would taken it to be a dream. I found myself leaning into the invisible hand that cradled my face like a starving man who had just found food. I never realized until that moment how long it had been since someone had held me. Any interactions with my father consisted of general talk. Physical contact was non-existent. In the faint crack of light that streamed through my half-open door, I made out the shrouded figure seated on the edge of my bed. I could have died right then and there. In all the time she'd haunted me, she never seemed to violate the sanctity of my room. I thought that it was the one place I'd be safe from her. Now, here she was, just inches away. I found myself paralyzed by fear if the slightest shift in weight would morph her caressing fingers into claws that would skewer my skull. My ears picked up on a soft melody, one I soon realized was coming from her, wheezed out through fluid drowned lungs, one that seemed vaguely familiar. She pulled herself closer until she was inches over me. My overworked heart felt seconds away from a coronary as her hum filled my ears. I couldn't take it anymore. I exploded from the covers and took off running down the hallway, propelled by pure animal instinct. I just wanted to get away as far away from her as possible. The floor lifted from my feet and I found myself flung forward into the dark void, impacting on several edges before my limp body rolled to a stop at the bottom of the stairs. Despite the pain searing through my sprained shoulder, I tried to steady myself to my feet when I saw the female outline that had materialized at the very top of the staircase. My heart plummeted into the pits of my stomach, my sobs mixing with terrified breaths as I rolled around in a desperate attempt to regain balance. She hovered down towards me, as weightless as air, arms wide and reaching for me. There was no way I was going to get out of this. She finally had me. The lights exploded on upstairs and the figure vanished into thin air. My pyjama clad father thundered down the steps. As soon as I saw the exhausted rage on his face, I found myself wishing for her return. Due to his job depending on physical alertness, my father prioritized a good night's sleep above anything else. No matter what happened, he would always be in bed by nine. Whenever something awoke him, he would be like an angry bear. That night, he had enough. He wrenched me up by the shoulders and started dragging me upstairs. Not wanting to face her again, I tried with every ounce of strength in my body to resist. But with him being at least twice my weight and height, I was little more than air to him. He jabbed a stubbed finger into the darkness of the corner, shoving me out. There! He snapped, spittle spraying out. Look, there's nothing there. No ghost, nothing. As soon as I blinked, she was there, staring out at me with those same dark, mournful eyes, her pale form caked with gore. I was so transfixed with my own terror that I didn't realize that my father had gone quiet. Her face changed with the sight of my father, her thin lips pursing as if she was about to say something. My father froze where he stood, arms still extended out towards the spot where she was standing. Though his face remained as stern as ever, the blood had drained, leaving his complexion marble-like. As I squinted closer, I saw trembles in his hands. Just as randomly as she had phased into existence, the bleeding woman was gone. My father heaved out a breath, the colour returning to his cheeks. 
I reached a trembling hand towards him, but he shrugged his bulky form away. Bed, he muttered gruffly. I shuffled into my room with my head bowed, flinching as his own door slammed behind me. I knew better than to disobey his orders. I clambered back into bed, burying myself as deep as I could beneath the covers so that she wouldn't find me. But the relief of sleep never came. The moment replayed over in my head. He had seen her too. The subsequent morning at the breakfast table had been spent in tight-lipped silence, with both of us refusing to acknowledge what had transpired the previous night. School and work had been a welcome reprieve for the both of us, as we had lost ourselves in the safe monotony of everyday routine, where ghosts and things that went bump in the night didn't exist. A week after it had happened, I had come home from school, when a series of heavy footsteps from above had shaken small fragments of plaster from the ceiling. Immediately, my already taxed heart thundered into overdrive, mind consumed with images of a hideous visage. The distant sound of a male clearing his throat from upstairs shattered my fear. Dad? What was he doing home so early? Against my better reasoning, I tiptoed up the stairs, wincing at the slightest creak that might give away my presence. I heard him trot around behind the half-closed bedroom door. Through the half-open door, my father seated himself on the bed, the mattress beneath groaning in protest. A bottle of wine was gripped in one hand, along with something silver-lined and rectangular in the other. But what I saw in there had me frozen where I stood. He was crying. In all the time I'd known him, my father had been a rock. A brick had once fallen from a scaffold at work and shattered his leg. He had barely even flinched. But there he was, tears rolling down his cheeks and soaking into his open palms. From the bleary, reddened state of his eyes, he looked like he had been doing it for a few hours. A strange sympathy washed over me. I knew I was looking at something I wasn't supposed to. Something so much deeper than I could ever understand. I slunk away from the door and left my father to weep himself into an inebriated sleep. I found myself pulled back to the room, feeling bold enough to creak open the door and sneak into the room. My father lay sprawled on the bed, the half-down bottle of wine still gripped in his hand, his broad chest shaking with thunderous snores. Clutched to his chest was the elusive silvery object, the one that had piqued my magpie fascination. I'd slid it out from my father's hands, just softly enough as to not stir him, although eliciting a murmured snore. I had taken a step back, holding it upwards towards a light that streamed in through the adjacent bedroom window. My father smiled back at me from the photograph within the frame, younger and clean-shaven. He was dressed in an immaculate black suit with a knife in hand that was half sunk into the top tier of a wedding cake adorned with ribbon flowers. He stood surrounded by similarly dressed people, their faces obscured by the camera flash. It was only when I shifted my hand that I saw the figure beside him in the trailing white dress, her face obscured by my thumb. When I lifted the picture up to inspect it, my heart stopped mid-beat. Next to my father, her gloved hand clutched tight in his, was the woman who had haunted me for years. Her dark hair was pinned up in a bun, half squinting into the camera with a deliriously happy grin on her face. The red she was splattered in was nowhere to be seen, just pure white. The simple lace trim she wore only accentuated her effervescent beauty. I had never seen such adoration on anyone's face before in the way my father looked at her. It was as if he was staring at the very source of his life. My lip trembled as the grim realisation hung over me. I turned to the half-open doorway and saw her hovering there, her mouth fallen in a downturned crescent. Only now, I understood her expression and the deep sadness ingrained in it. 
I found the rest out later. My mother had been just a week away from her due date when a similarly pregnant neighbour had invited her over to have some old baby clothes of hers. My mother, having always prided herself on being a thrifter, had jumped at the chance. Only, the neighbour didn't have any baby clothes. Just a pair of scissors. That same neighbour would turn up to the emergency ward two hours later with my blooded newborn self in her arms, claiming to have given birth. But a quick examination by the doctors showed that the uterus and ovaries that were still attached to me, along with a half-severed umbilical cord, weren't hers. In court, she claimed that she was afraid her husband was going to leave her, so she faked a pregnancy. But as the date of delivery approached, she realised that she needed a baby, by any means necessary. The police found my mother in the basement. Her body had been stuffed into a trash bag, stewing in her own congealing blood. She had been ripped open from the crotch to sternum, her innards pulled past her knees, but her slashed, rigor mortis stiffened hands were still protectively clutching around her belly. Nearly every part of her was slathered with red, except for two clear streaks running down the sides of her face. The only reason my father hadn't been with her was because he was out buying a crib that he'd been saving up for months to put in the nursery they'd been decorating together. He wanted to surprise her. He'd never blamed me for her death, not for one moment. After the sentence had been passed, my father had moved me away from the media furore that surrounded the case and spent the first few years of my life moving from town to town, determined to keep me from ever finding out the grim story of how I had come into this world. So, when I started ranting on about a lady covered in blood in the house, it had scared him more than anything. The night she appeared before him convinced him it hadn't just been the overactive imagination of a lonely child. After that day, his whole demeanour changed. He'd become softer with me. We started talking together, even laughing. It was as if some deity had overheard my childhood wish for a father who cared. But he never forgave himself for not going with her. He kept on drinking, and eventually, cirrhosis took him while I was in my first year of university. He'd never been so small before. His wizened, bald head peeking up from the draping covers. He looked so frail, having aged what looked like 20 years in just a few his withered hand clasped mine, and he smiled over my shoulder at the empty corner of the hospital room. We made a great kid, didn't we, Angie? He remarked. I didn't have to turn around to see who he was addressing. She was already there. She'd always been. Despite the agony of the last few months of his life, my father had died smiling. That was five years ago. Although my grief has lessened with the passage of time, I still try to live my life for both of them, especially my mother. Whenever I see that pale, dark-edged figure glancing out from behind a corner or behind me whenever I'm confronted with a reflective surface, there's no more spine-prickling fear, nor any heart palpitations. Instead, I feel home. Sometimes I get angry at myself that it took so long for me to figure it out. She never wanted to hurt me. All she had ever wanted to do was hold me, like any mother would. And I ran away from her. No wonder she wept. She still comes at night to sing to me. I don't flinch away whenever her broken hands tussle my hair. Instead, letting a warbling lullaby wash over me and send me into blissful darkness. There was a time where I would have given everything that I owned to never see her again. Now, I beg her to stay. No matter how much I wish for it to be otherwise, by the time the morning streams through my half-closed blinds, she's long since disappeared from this world. But my eyes always still burn with tears. It was the same dream I've been having for years. 
The rain pelting off the top of my Honda. The darkness around my headlights as black as ink. The ZZ Top song still playing from the speakers. The mansion and the hill still occupied with a single lit window. I was too terrified to comprehend what had happened. What was around me? Normally, that would be the part where I slung open the door and got out. But this particular dream ended as soon as I engaged the door handle. I found myself waking up with a headache, similar to a dull throb that trailed a night of drinking. Only, I hadn't had a drop in years. It wasn't my sight that first alerted me to the foreign atmosphere. My skin felt fuzzy. It tickled even. I lay prone on the thick, beige carpet of a room. The walls were painted lilac and were bare. This was not my room. Through my headache fog, I spotted a door and tried to get up. Once on my haunches, I took in the rest. Above was a simple ceiling fan. On one wall was a window with thick blackout curtains closed shut. In a far corner stood a massive stuffed animal in an orange jumpsuit. Next to that was a tall dresser. Closer to me was a nightstand with an unopened bottle of bourbon on top. Opposite the nightstand was a twin-sized bed adorned with a thick comforter and a mound of colourful throw pillows. I couldn't remember where I was or how I'd gotten there. Nothing was familiar. I used the wall for stability and rose to my feet when the mound of pillows started to move. Out from the comforter slipped a man. He rolled off the bed and into the floor, moaning and clutching his salt and pepper hair. His headache must have been worse than mine. I retreated to the door. The knob refused the twist, so I pulled the door with all my might. The door didn't budge. During my efforts, the man had found his composure and grew startled upon the sight of me. What the hell is this? He said as he sat on the bed. Who the hell are you? Look man, I just want to leave. The door won't open. Why did you bring me here? Who the hell? I didn't bring you here, I shouted. I woke up in here, just like you. The man clutched his head again. Is this some kind of joke? It's not very funny if it is. Do you know what's going on? He gave me a baleful look. What's your name? Chris, you? All right, Chris, he said, then spat on the carpet. Let's say I believe you're as confused as I am. How long have you been awake? Not long. I'm telling the truth. I don't know what's going on. The man looked away and looked in the room as I had. Only... His expression was more emotional, giving away his misgivings about the place. His head pivoted from side to side, his breathing sped up, eyes swelling with tears. The man was rugged, muscles under tanned skin, a pack a day smoke of voice. It's strange that a man this burly would get flustered so easily. The door's locked, but maybe we can get out through the window. He cut his eyes to me, wiping his wet cheeks. Who the hell are you? I told you, my name is Chris. No, I mean, who are you? How do you know me? I've never seen you before, man. Honest. The man rose from the bed and approached me. His eyes were pale, and a thin scar went from his chin to his throat. It was only after he turned away to fidget with the doorknob did I see how large the man really was. The stranger could easily overpower me. My confusion of the situation had turned into fear. Damn, he said after no look with the door. He went to the window and drew open the thick curtains. What the hell? Daylight had been replaced with pitted concrete. There wasn't even glass for a window. The man and I stared at the grey rectangle for a while, dumbfounded. Whoever put us in the room wanted us to stay there. After some deliberation, we tried three attempts at freedom. First, we took turns slamming our shoulders and feet into the door to no avail. Next, the man tapped around for studs in the walls, but when nothing sounded promising, he tried to punch through. However, the walls were solid wood, so his knuckles started to bleed. 
the last attempt unsettled me the most as it displayed my roommate's sheer strength. He lifted me above his head while I punched the ceiling for weak spots. In the end, we were still trapped, both of us mending bloody knuckles. We decided to ponder some more. Know anything about that teddy bear? I asked. Looks like it did a stint in prison, the man said with a chuckle. How so? That orange jumpsuit, prison attire. None of this makes sense. We need some time to think. Seems we have all the time in the world, buddy. I paced around the room and leaved through possible reasons for our capture, ricocheting ideas off one another to think of a solution to the problem. I didn't know the man. The room was unfamiliar to me. Whoever put me in here did so with cruel intent. After a few minutes, the man sat on the bed and I slumped down by the front door. When I did, I heard a crinkle. Check your pocket, I said, and fished out a scrap of paper from my own. He did the same and found the same. Both scraps in a verbiage of font style. I read it aloud. It cuts the air, gives more comfort than shade, and it does all of this with a spin of a blade. A riddle? The man asked incredulously. So, this is a bloody joke. I mulled it over in my mind before figuring it out. The man must have done the same, because we looked up at the same time. He stood on the bed, his boots lost in the thick rolls of fabric, and tried to rip the ceiling fan from its brackets. Like the door, it didn't budge. Try the blades, I said. He wiped his hand along the top of each blade. Dust fell like snow with each wipe, but on the last blade, a scrap of paper fell. I fetched it and read it aloud. A bottle of brown may turn the night red. Two drunks under watch, but only one fled. The man spoke to me, but I wasn't paying him attention. Could the riddle mean what I thought? I looked at the scrap of paper, tracing the words with my eyes and memory, reciting the riddle in my head, before stuffing it in the pocket with my other. What? I asked. Sorry, I didn't hear you. I said the answer to that riddle is simple too. The bottle of bourbon had already been lifted from the nightstand and was being uncorked with ease. He tipped the bottle back and pursed his lips. Wait! I shouted. What? It could be, I don't know, poison or something. He smelt it, shrugged. It's all poison. He took a long pull and his face puckered when the bottle was lifted from his mouth. He preferred it to me, but I shook my head. I don't drink. You don't drink? Sober for years. Ah, he said with a laugh. A married man? No, I'm not married. Sobriety is a personal choice. I got carried away for a while, so I stopped. He took another long pull and set the bottle back on the nightstand. Boozing is a personal choice for me too, Chris. Well, it was. Before... Ah, never mind. What the hell are we going to do now? I stepped around the bed and picked up the bottle. I was investigating for anything noteworthy on the wild turkey label when the man introduced himself. I'm Anson, by the way. Sorry if I was being such a hard ass earlier. I rotated the bottle under the ceiling fan light. Understandable, given the situation, man. You seem like an okay guy, Chris. So, I'll shoot it to you straight. I haven't been completely honest with you. For a second, I thought about how hard it would be to use the bourbon bottle as a weapon if necessary. Oh, really? How so? When I woke up, I couldn't believe it. He looked over the room again. It's not exactly the same, but it's close. I don't understand, I said, going back to my investigation of the label. Whoever the hell put us in here must have some kind of vendetta against me. You see... This room looks eerily similar to my daughter's room. Your daughter's room? Why would someone do that? I asked, 
then found a phrase on the label that had been circled with a red pen. Good damn question. I don't know why someone would drag my daughter into this. She's been dead for three years. I'm sorry to hear that. That's awful. He stared at his feet. If there's a singular moment in my life that changed everything, it would have been that. The late night call from the deputy, the coroner's office, my wife, well, ex-wife now, wailing when they drew back the sheet. Time doesn't heal all wounds, you know. I understand that more than you know. He looked up and I met his eyes. Nice to meet you, Anson, by the way. So, here is some good news. I found something circled in the bottle. Here. Anson turned the bottle over. It's the wild turkey slogan. Crafted with conviction. Mean anything to you? Doesn't mean anything to me. His gaze stuck to the corner of the room. He pointed. You think? Conviction? Like a convict? I dashed to the teddy bear, donning the orange prisoner jumpsuit. Obviously, I capped her at a sense of humour. I picked the fluffy toy up by the head and inspected the front, back and under the paws. Nothing. Shake it, Anson said. It did nothing. Give it here. I tossed Anson the bear. He held it up close to his chest. Then, with a plush arm in each hand, ripped the bear in half. Polyester stuffing erupted out and littered the bedspread. Anson sifted through the white fluff before he lifted a scrap of paper from the largest wad. He unrolled it and read it aloud. My effects it holds. Your effects it conceals. Open the drawer to see what it reveals. The dresser, I shouted, and ran to the large piece of furniture. I rolled back the top drawer. Empty. The second. Empty. Each one I opened was bare. Just a few pieces of wood nailed together to form shallow shafts of antlerous drawers. By that time, Anson was hunched over my shoulder, eagerly anticipating some clue for our inevitable predicament. His reply for each empty slot was a curse word. Then, I pulled the bottom one. When I glided open the bottom drawer, I saw something inside, but Anson's head disappeared from my peripheral. I turned to find him on his knees, digging into the shallow storage area before lifting a pleated orange and blue cloth. He brought the cloth up and sank into his face. He began to sob. What is it, Anson? His large hand unfolded the cloth and he stretched it out. He was a cheerleader uniform. I could hear him sniffing behind the name of the local high school. My daughter, he managed to get out. It's my daughter's uniform. How? I mean, how the hell did this get here? My head began to pound. Was this really happening? I wanted to run, to escape this potential danger. Even though this stranger was knelt under me, I could see that his wide shoulders housed muscles from decades at the gym. He was getting frantic, paranoid. Had he been lying to me? Were things becoming clear to Anson? Was the puzzle coming together for him, yet he refused to educate me on his clarity? Did he know something that I didn't? I thought you said your daughter died. She did. It was after a football game. She was on the cheerleading squad, you see. After the game, she and her boyfriend drove to one of the local spots to have a bonfire with some friends. On the way, they had a big fight and she demanded to be let out of the car. The boyfriend, a piece of crap, got all mad and left her on the side of the road. That asshole. Anson twisted the uniform so hard it squeaked. By the time he turned back, he found her dead on the side of the road. I had to steady myself with the top of the dresser. My god, that's terrible. Police weren't any help. Personally, I think their boyfriend did it. Maybe it was an accident, maybe it wasn't. He was a piece of crap, his whole family too. Lawyered up real fast. Amanda had a ton of boyfriends, 
but he was the worst. There was a spark from him. Something in his expression changed, and he looked up at me. Anson extended a finger. How the hell do you fit into all this, huh? Who are you? Anson, calm down. I told you, I'm Chris. I know you're Chris. All this stuff we keep finding about Amanda. Why? I didn't realize I was withdrawing until my back was prodded by the doorknob. I don't know. Honest. I've never met Amanda. He crumpled to the floor, the cheerleader uniform clutched to his chest. He wailed like a pained father. A father that had potential memories of graduations, a wedding announcement, and grandchildren stolen from him. A father who would never get to hug his daughter again. He leaned his head on one of the jutting drawers, which caused the tall dresser to sway, unbalanced. I wanted to touch his shoulder, to tell him everything would work out, that we would get out of here. But I was too anxious, too expectant of him to lash out. Instead, I chose to comfort him in a more utilitarian way. Anson, you need to keep going. Don't give up. We need to find the next riddle. The tension in his arms loosened. The sobs grew lighter. It was working. You seem like a great father, Anson. I mean it. And Amanda would want you to keep fighting, right? He blotted his eyes with the uniform and hugged it as if it was filled out by his daughter. He opened the skirt portion and inspected the inside of the uniform. Under the neckline, he snatched something, then brandished a strip of paper. He used a thick forearm to wipe away some tears, then read a next clue aloud. Gather them for beauty, or plant a weary head, or perhaps there'll be a weapon for a fight instead. Anson rose to his feet and draped one curtain over his wrist. Beauty or weary head. Curtains can be pretty and can be used to darken a room. Agree? Maybe, I said, searching around the room. What about the bed? He let go of the curtain and we ripped the comforter from the mattress. The throw pillows scattering on the carpet like dandelion seeds in the wind. We peeled off the remaining sheets and bundled them in the corner. Flipping the mattress was easy. Anson practically did it by himself. While he was using brute strength to rip a hole in the mattress fabric, I was corralling the box spring near the door. I too needed some room to start deconstructing. By the time we had finished, it looked as if an avalanche of cotton had spontaneously fallen from the ceiling. Banks of fluff piled against walls, broken pieces of wood and wire from the box spring littered the carpet. Strips of soft fabric were draped over wads of foam. Anson and I were exhausted, more so by the fact that our search ended without success. I crawled to my usual spot by the door while Anson clicked to the garish throw pillows and relaxed on them. He reached the nightstand and grabbed the bourbon. After a quick drink, he gave a little laugh. Chris, I'm tired as hell. Me too. My fingers are on fire and my arms feel like taffy. He grunted and his eyes went blank. I swear to God, when I found out who did this, I'm gonna kill him. He looked at me when he said that. I was unsure if it was an accusatory glare or just a natural conversational eye contact. Either way, I knew by his tone he was serious. A rabid dog trapped in a corner would bite anyone, even an innocent owner. I concentrated my efforts to curtail his hostility. What time do you think it is? I asked. Another quick drink. No idea. I have no idea either. But I do know we need to find the next riddle soon. There's no food in here. No water. I'm getting thirsty. Here. He offered me the bottle. Wet your whistle. I'm good. Thanks though. I can barely stay awake as it is. Maybe a nap is in order. Anson took a long pull of the whiskey and returned it to the nightstand. He wiggled on his bed of pillows before finding the most comfortable spot. 
A nap would be excellent. Maybe some rest will clear out our heads and help us figure out this last riddle. Beauty or weary head my ass. I'll just rest my weary head on these damn pillows. In a lightning strike of inspiration, we traded glances like we both struck oil at the same time. Anson rolled off the throw pillows and I trudged over the foam and splinters to his makeshift bed. We used the broken timber to puncture the pillows one by one before ripping them into obscurity. I found the next scrap of paper hidden inside one of the red pillows. I read it aloud. Thick like grass, though it's not mowed. Worn like asphalt, though it's not road. Muffled screams and whispers, it does do. Litter and hair and dirt, it does accrue. I read it several times in a row, hoping the reiteration would bring more clarity. When I brought the paper down, I saw Anson was equally as perplexed. Perhaps it was the confusion, but without a word, we went back to our resting spots. His pillow bed was much more lumpy than before, but judging by the rate at which he drank from the bottle, he didn't mind. I was against the door, thinking about the riddle, about what was left in the room. Anson spoke first. This riddle is longer, harder too. I agree. Thick like grass, though it's not mowed? Grass, like marijuana? You don't mow that. Maybe like syrup or something. Syrup is thick. He scratched his salt and pepper hair. Worn like asphalt, but not a road. A sidewalk, a dirt trail. Litter and hair and dirt. That line is strange. A hairbrush accrues those things, right? What's that part about screams? He asked. I unrolled the paper again. Muffle screams and whispers, it does do. These riddles suck, he said, then took another sip. The poet is no Robert Frost, that's for sure. Worn like asphalt, though it's not a road. What the hell does that mean? Anson got to his feet and took in a mouthful of whiskey. He stumbled a bit and used the nightstand for balance. Look, there isn't much in this room. I say we break everything in here. We're bound to find something after we do that. I agreed. I was ready to leave that room, part ways from that emotional and now drunk man who was distraught from the dredged up memories of his daughter. Anson went to the dresser and began breaking off pieces while I focused on the nightstand. The stand was simple. I removed the drawer. Empty. I searched the underside, but there was no strip of paper, no additional clue, nothing that got us one step closer to liberty. I inverted the stand so the legs pointed up and plunged my heel into the center. The wood snapped and I meticulously scoured the debris for a strip of paper or cloth, anything with words. It was then that I realized the bottle of whiskey was gone. I checked in the mound of foam behind me, thinking it must have toppled when I upturned the stand. But to my surprise, I found the bottle, nearly empty, next to Anson, who was ripping up the carpet. The remains of the dresser were beside him. His strength and drunkenness had aided his ability to turn the dresser into matchsticks before I could undo a simple wooden nightstand. Anson gripped the edge of the carpet, pulling it with all his might. There were faint ripping noises in quick succession and the carpet rose an inch. He re-gripped and continued to pull. Help me, damn it, he demanded. What are you doing? Carpet. The answer to the riddle might be carpet. I chuckled. You might be right, man. And I found this. Listen. Listen. He tapped his heel on the spot on the carpet that was directly beneath where the dresser had stood. Every tap of his boot created a rumpling, crinkling noise. Something's gotta be down there, under the carpet. Help me. I clutched another section of carpet and helped him, between his breaks to finish off the bottle of course. We peeled the carpet back, inch by inch, until we had enough to get a proper grip. A few more pulls and a quarter of the room was carpetless. I heaved it one more time for good measure, 
but Anton spotted something and jumped over the coil of rolled carpet. What is it? You found something? I asked as he bent down on the solid concrete foundation. There was a pile of papers on the floor. Clues, more riddles. Some sheets were wrinkled from Anson's boot earlier. From my angle, I couldn't tell what they said, so I sauntered up next to my roommate. His hands were rapidly going from page to page, his movements angry and frantic. My next step gave me an angle to see over his shoulder. It wasn't more riddles. It was piles and photographs. What? Anson whispered to himself. What is this? What the hell? What? I managed to pick one up. Let me see if I can... He was on me before I could say anything. I didn't get a good look at the photograph, but I didn't need a good look. I knew what they showed. One of Anton's large palms tightened around my collar and he slammed me into the wall beside the sunless window. In his other hand were photographs. He waved them around, slapping my forehead with them. Tunnel vision ensued and trapped me in the past. Suddenly, all the clues made sense. Three years ago, I was driving my Honda Accord down a secluded highway, lined with affluent homes across a bluff. It was late, and I was beyond drunk, a habit that had landed me two DUIs and a broken marriage. That night, I swerved and rolled into the shoulder more times than I could count, doing my best to follow the dotted line. There were no street lamps, so the darkness outside my headlights was as black as ink. I fished for my phone and turned on a ZZ Top song. When it started to rain, the sober person would have slowed down, but in my state, with my faculties muted with alcohol and my adrenaline pumping from the music, I sped up. I didn't see her until it was too late. I slammed on my brakes afterwards. I was too terrified to comprehend what had happened, what was around me. The song still hollering from the speakers, the rain still pelting the top of my Honda, but I felt stuck. After gaining my composure, I slung open the door and ran down the asphalt through the pools of water, using my phone light to search. When I found her, it felt like a dream. She was beautiful and young. She was in a cheerleader uniform. There was rain diluted blood all around. I was drunk, very drunk, but I knew what I did. The wild turkey bottle in my car had spilled all over my seat so I grabbed the bottle and tossed it down the ravine. The rain was hammering so hard, I didn't hear the glass shatter. Then I left her. I hopped in my sedan and took off back the way I came, winding down the road to escape what I had just done. I deserve to be in prison, I kept telling my drunk self. I deserve to die for what I did. Before I rounded the corner, I saw at the top of the cliff one solitary window lit in a mansion above. It sat prominently on the bluff like a lighthouse. That mansion, that window. I always wondered if they witnessed what I did. And now, seeing that photo, that particular angle, I now know they not only witnessed it, but took detailed photos of the accident, clearly showing my car, the young, lifeless cheerleader, and my face. A face that Anson immediately recognized. I wanted to apologize, to tell Anson I'm sorry for killing his daughter. It was an accident. I wanted to ask him for forgiveness. None of this was possible because of his grip around my throat. Those tears were coming back, swelling in his eyes before spilling over angry red cheeks. My tunnel vision intensified. My weight sank to the floor. I thought it was the end. Finally, my punishment had come. Then, I felt the empty whiskey bottle beside me. My strike was faster than Anson's drunk reaction. The bottle shattered against his skull and he fell to the side. I took in three deep gulps of air and sprinted to the door. I shouted for help. I shouted to be let out. 
The only one who answered was Anson. He took me to the ground and I fell into the remains of the dresser. Splinters and small nails poked my back as Anson wailed against my face with his fists. I felt my nose crunch under the force. Warm blood sprayed like a geyser from my brow. I tried shaking him off, punching him in defense, but his sheer strength kept me in place. By then, Anson was roaring mad, spittle dripping from his scowl. His actions sprang from pure hatred. I groped for something, anything to defend myself. His weight bore heavy on me, and the broke pieces of the dresser started to push deeper into my skin. My face was throbbing, and then my back was on fire. Blood was making it difficult to see. Then, my fingers found a long piece of wood. When Anton rose up and called his arm back for another blow, I shoved the piece of wood into him. I caught him in the neck, and he slipped off of me. Without thinking, I grabbed one of the bedsheets and twisted it into a rope and then anchored it around Anson's neck. He struggled, his massive hands squeezing at my shoes in pleading attempts for me to release my grip. I didn't. When I was sure, I let go. I sobbed after that, but not for long. The window was still barricaded by concrete. The door didn't budge. I was still trapped. I dug through some of the debris on the ground, the foam, fabric, wooden pillows, searching for anything we may have missed. Nothing. I picked up the photographs and studied them with more detail. They were from a professional camera with a high-grade lens that allowed for optimum zoom. I was clearly visible beside my dented Honda. The rain blurred some of the details, but the main focus was clear. The beautiful young woman, now I know her name was Amanda, was lifeless on the asphalt beside me. I scattered the photos. I was furious, lost. But when I grabbed the photos and tossed them around the room, I saw a metal wire running between the foundation and carpet. On the end of the wire was a large loop. Curious, I took the loop and tugged at it. Nothing happened, so I tugged harder. The door creaked open. Past the door, down the dark hallway, then through a heavy steel door. I was outside in the bright midday sun, the vast ocean to my right and meandering hills to my left. But something looked familiar down below. The road. It was the road of my accident three years earlier. The one that killed Amanda. I turned around to find I was standing in the yard of a mansion. The one that had a single lit window the night of the accident. Directly behind it, from where i just left, was a modified shipping container. I ran, down the hills, over a stream, through a neighborhood. I knew I had to get far away before I asked for help. Before someone would lend me a cell phone to call an Uber or cab. I couldn't go to the police, or else it would expose Amanda's death, along with her father's. Whoever lived in that house, whoever modified that shipping container for some macabre escape room, knew that whoever survived the encounter would never report it to the authorities. And they were correct. I still have the same dream. The rain pelting the top of my Honda, the darkness around my headlights as black as ink, the ZZ Top song still playing from the speakers, the mansion on the hill still occupied with a single lit window. I'm too terrified to comprehend what's happened, what's around me. Only now, in my dream, that yellow window atop the bluff turns into a spotlight and points to me as I sob in the rain. Who controls the spotlight? I will never know. It occurs during periods of high stress from a lack of blood flow to the eyes. If you're lucky, you only get it in one eye. 
I get it in both. It can last anywhere from a few seconds to a few minutes. My life was the definition of high stress and by doctor's orders, I needed to get out and relieve myself. That's how I met Roger and Ron. I'd always wanted to get on a boat, ever since I was a kid. When life takes its twists and turns, it sometimes leads you down an interesting path. Roger was the owner of the boat, Anna Marie, and Ron was a friend he had known a long time. They were tuna fishermen, and through what seemed like fate, I ran into them. Next thing I knew, I was headed out on a week-long trip to tuna fish on an adventure I would never forget. Three days into our journey, and without much luck the past few hours, Roger got up out of the captain's chair and walked to the stern where Ron and I sat watching the lines, waiting for tuna. We might be heading back here soon, Roger said, cigarette dangling from his lips. Why? I was just down in the freezer earlier today and we still got quite a lot of room for fish, I said. Weather. Getting bad, I'm afraid. Look over there, off port side. Man, that still looks ways off. Sure it isn't going to go around us? The clouds don't even look big at all. Let me look at the radar, Ron said, pushing past Roger and I and heading for the cabin. Stubborn as a mule, Roger said, flicking his cigarette. He always wanted to come out here and stay as long as it takes to fill her up, but sometimes you gotta know when to quit. Roger turned and headed back into the cabin and a small heated exchange began. After a few minutes, Ron came storming out. He is right, unfortunately. But hell, either way, we're going to get caught in a bit of bad weather. We're going to start heading back now, but tonight might get a little rocky. Come on, help me reel the lines in. After we put everything away and started heading back, you could look out and see the dark clouds getting closer and closer. I was a little terrified, and I know it showed. Roger kept assuring me that everything was going to be fine, and he had weathered much more ghastly storms in the Anna Marie than the small one that was headed our way. When night hit, it got dark, real dark. The clouds covered the moon, and not an inkling of light passed through. We sat sipping coffee to keep us alert and listened to the rain increase in temperament. Ain't no thing, just a little rain. Looking at the radar, seems it won't be going on too long, Roger said, taking a swig of coffee. Rain started pelting harder and harder, as if the gods themselves decided to prove just how incorrect Roger was. The wind started howling, and as I looked out the small cabin window, I saw something which made me rub my eyes. What is that? On the window? I set my coffee down and looked out towards the cabin door. On the overall shaped glass were raindrops, except these raindrops were dark, a shade of red bordering on black, and they appeared to be sticky. Rain falls and slides down surfaces, leaves a trail behind its origin and plummets towards the floor. These raindrops splattered against the glass with hostility, smacking into one another and coating the entire glass with a dark hue like looking through a pair of darkened sunglasses. Roger shot up from his seat, spilling coffee over the table and onto the cream-coloured floor. Get away from there, now! he shouted. Ron bolted up and with more haste than I thought possible of him, turned off the lights in the cabin so we're in total darkness. Get down, stay quiet and don't make a noise. If you don't listen to me, you will absolutely die. Ron shouted in horror. At that moment, I heard Roger flail onto the nearby bed as Ron flopped to the floor. In the darkness, I couldn't see anything, but Ron and Roger had no reason to lie to me. Seeing their faces meant that whether it was true or not, the words they expressed, they wholeheartedly believed. I flung myself onto the bed on the opposite side of the room of Roger, nearly tripping over Ron's feet as he lay between us on the floor. All was quiet. My heart was pounding in my ears, and I dared not speak. As my mind started to wonder whether this may be some sort of trick, the boat started to creak. 
boats always creak and sway and moan their song as they battle the waves of the sea. But this wasn't one of those songs. This was a song of fear. I could feel myself slowly sliding towards the cabin door as if the boat was tipping. The boat was rocking against the waves, but something was anchoring us down towards the bottom. I looked over and in the darkness could see the outline of Ron's figure flat on his back, gripping the legs of the bolted table to prevent himself from sliding. Then, just as quickly as it had came, we leveled out. The front of the boat slammed against the water, nearly bouncing me from the very surface I lay on. The dishes flew from the table and out of their cabinets. They tinged and dinged and shattered into a million pieces on the floor and countertops. I heard the crunching and sailing of paper through the air, the small whispered gasps of surprise from my crewmates, and the boat sang its songs as it creaked and groaned and gasped for air. I dared raise my head from my pillow and glance towards the door. Through the darkened hue of the glass, I saw the figure. It was too dark to see it fully, but it was definitely not human. That's when it happened. Everything went black. Amorosis Fugax. I wanted to scream. I wanted to cry out and beg to God above to spare me from whatever horror or trick was being played on me. But I couldn't. Fear gripped me like an iron fist as I plopped my head against the cool pillow. As my pulse beat faster and faster, I could feel my blood vessels swell and contract. I could feel eyes burn as tears started to well up in the corners of my eyes. The door, heavy as it was, flew open with tremendous force as it slammed against the interior of the cabin. It sounded as if whatever had opened it had nearly removed it from its hinges and jammed. As pieces of glass rained down to the floor with a series of thuds and cracks, I winced. A sharp, ear-piercing pain filled my ears as a high-pitched squeal bellowed from the doorway. I shut my eyes as hard as I could until I felt they were going to recede into the back of my head. Either bits of spittle or rain from the outside flaked onto my face in a light mist. I wanted so badly to wipe my face and cover my ears, but I couldn't. I heard a loud smack of footsteps on the floor. Whatever was on the boat was heavy. They slapped against the floor. The sound reminded me of a duck walking on pavement, webbed feet. It took a few steps and in a beast-like fashion. It sniffed and snorted like a beagle on the trail of a squirrel. I could hear the creature coming closer. The rain was coming in through the doorway now, as the creature was no longer blocking the entrance. Globs of rain came down against my nose and cheeks, and I could feel their stickiness. It felt like syrup being dumped on my face, and it smelt faintly of acid. It did not burn, and it did not sting but its tingling sensation was uncomfortable. My eyes continued to burn, and I could feel the tears streaming down my face. The only thing I could think about was that I hoped this was a bad dream. I hoped to wake up any moment from this horror and laugh as I caught fish with Ron and told Roger of my nightmare as he smoked a cigarette. The creature's breath grew louder, and I could feel its presence shifting into my direction. I could feel its intimidating shadow tower over my body as I lay there trying not to breathe or wail in terror. I felt my palms coat with sweat as the creature's body continued to get closer. It felt only inches from my face. I could feel its hot breath on my forehead as it sucked in air, sniffing the room around me. Its throat made a low grumble as I heard it snarl its teeth. The teeth chattered together with small vibrations and I felt a massive drop of liquid drop onto my cheek. It burned and ached and I could feel the skin eroding away where the glob had landed. Then a loud clang came from the other side of the room. It sounded as if a dangling piece of silverware had finally decided to crash to the ground as the boat sang its song. I felt the creature raise its head and look towards the sound. As the shadow of death raised from my body, I opened my eyes. 
it was still total darkness, and I was still blind. As the wind whirled outside and pelted against the sides of the boat, it almost masked the sharp jab of pain I heard utter from the mouth of Ron beside me. The creature, in its haste to investigate the strange noise, had stepped on Ron. Ron let out the smallest noise, but like a shark with blood in its nose, the creature sounded excited. It chattered its teeth and let out another blood-curdling shriek that seemed to echo inside the small cabin. As the boat creaked and groaned against the weight of the mighty ocean, I heard the creature's jaws chomp as it clanged its teeth against each other. I could hear the blood gurgling from Ron's mouth as the creature laid into him as he tried to curse the gods above for his misfortune. I could hear the popping of bones and the shredding of flesh as the creature filled its belly. There was nothing I could do but try not to picture the man beside me being torn apart by the jaws of death. Bits of blood and flesh could be heard speckling the interior of the cabin as Ron's gurgling began to stop. I tried not to weep and I could feel the bile rising up my esophagus and tried not to vomit. I put my hand over my mouth and squeezed as hard as I could and feared I would be next should I make a sound. For the next few moments, all was quiet except the grating of the boat and the creature's tongue mopping the blood-soaked floor for any remnants. It was now, of all times, I started to pee. The anticipation of what the creature would do next and the thought of what it was capable of soaked my jeans. As the air filled with ammonia and fear, I thought for sure the creature would use its sense of smell to detect my presence. To my surprise, I started to hear its webbed feet slap the floor as it began to walk towards the door. As soon as it had came, it was gone. I lay quiet, starting to smell the stink of blood and listen to the noises, daring not to breathe. The song of the boat began to wither and the seas began to calm. The gooey rain began to lessen and I dared to look up again. My vision returned and peering out of the broken doorway, I could finally see. I saw the bloody soaked footprints of the beast leading towards the bow glistening off the moonlight of the quickly clearing sky. The stars were beginning to shine, and as I looked over towards Ron, laying in pieces of shattered flesh, I began to weep. I'm part of the United States Special Forces, the Green Berets, and have been for several years now. In my tenure, I've deployed multiple times to Afghanistan, Iraq, a few months in Syria, several African countries. I've been to all four corners of the globe, and I've seen my fair share of the good, the bad, and the ugly that comes from being part of SOCOM. I've got plenty of stories, some more interesting than others, but almost all of them are heavily classified behind red tape that will never be declassified until I'm dead and gone. However, there was an incident a few nights ago that stuck out from all the others, mostly because one, unlike all of our other operations that took us the combat zones across the distant hemisphere, this one happened right at home in our own backyard. The enemies weren't a foreign proxy, a group of insurgents, it wasn't even human. Stuff from that night is still weird, and it's not like Command is going to give us any answers. It's the reason I'm bypassing everything I've been told, disregarding and putting my ass on the line, even if I use false information and withhold names. Plenty of innocent people have died, as you'll find out. An upper command would sooner bury it than acknowledge the deaths and give their families closure. I don't have all the answers of what happened in that Western Tennessee National Park, but I do have enough to let people know the truth. Semi-truth, anyways. For safety and privacy purposes, I stated previous, I'm withholding a lot of personal information, such as names, exact locations, and unit information, referring to smaller stuff that I don't think even the scary three-letter groups could really trace, even if they cared. I hope they don't.
Like I said, I'm part of a SOCOM Green Beret A-Team. You all know who the Green Berets are. You should. My team is nicknamed Raider, a general theme in our company, naming things after warrior culture-esque terms. Raider, Artemis, Barbarian, Centurion, etc. It's a 10-man element. The team lead, a way too salty Georgian captain with a warrant officer, a medic, a comm sergeant, and six weapon sergeants. Our captain decided this way was best. Considering we're all in one piece after our last mission, he was right. Our weekend was calm and boring as we rotated on QRF, Quick Reaction Force, for the month. QRF means that if someone, somewhere, needs the green-eyed boogeymen of the Western world, we were ready to kit up and be there at a moment's notice. It just so happened, right when some of us were getting ready to head to the bar and have our two singular authorized beers of QRF month, we were called. When we raced back to our COP and got our stuff ready, the captain came with some surprising information. We'd be able to probably make it back for those beers because we were heading to West Tennessee. Of all places. We didn't know what the status was yet. Command didn't give us any information. What the op for was. What weapons they had. What the layout of the area was. Nothing. But being QRF team, Raider still kitted up and we were at the HLZ in less than 20. While we waited for our transport, the captain finally got some information. Apparently, a facility in the middle of uninhabited, restricted woods of a national park had activated a distress signal. The woods it was situated in was a large national park in, like I said, Western Tennessee, with a long history of disappearances on its now frequently closed and blocked off trails and campsites. This raised a few questions. What was this facility? Why was it in a national park? What happened to need to roll out the angriest Green Beret team this side of the East Coast to act as its backup? Why were we going there when in an hour, someone in Libya or someone across Eurasia might need us to back them up? The captain acknowledged all of these questions, but assured us that's all he knew. He's been with our team for years now, several deployments to the box and back, and he's always been straight with us. It's how we knew he was lying. Our transport finally arrived, 160th SOAR, Night Stalkers, an aviation unit that's been around for nearly 40 years, having dragged every single kind of SOCOM unit to every single part of the world. We expected the Black Hawk they brought, but the armed escort of two birds that came with them was a surprise. We were in domestic America. We were going to Tennessee. Why were they here? Even with the Night Stalkers flying at top speed across several states, it still took a couple of hours to reach our landing point. The inside of that bird going full throttle was deafening, even with the electronic headsets we were sporting. It was ear-splitting. And yet, while sitting next to the captain, I could tell he was speaking to someone on a different frequency. This was off, because normally he'd go to the comm sergeant and have to use the radio, but he had a side channel filled in his radio, talking to someone, writing down incoming information. I was able to peek over and saw some of the things he was writing. Mascal, close quarters up four, no blue four on X. The birds touched down in the middle of an empty parking lot outside of the local ranger station. We filled out to the open area. The birds took off. The captain chimed in on our team net. Raider Romero, this is Raider lead. Get on the net and have them hold orbit in case we need close air. Break. He then broke transmission and talked to us. All Raiders hold outside and take up security. I'm going to get the damn Ragnar. Prepare for a hasty ass ramp brief. I just got more information. We all took positions behind some of the parked vehicles the Rangers would use. Just to clear things up, our team was outfitted with GPNVG also known as quad nods, four-barreled night vision optics that provided an almost daytime-like view of our surroundings. Couple that with our PEQs mounted on our rifles, allowing us to see and shoot anything at night. 
as the military says, we own the night. The tree line in front of us was lit up like a goddamn operator rave party as the captain walked back, nods down as the ranger currently on shift followed him. He keyed into our net and we could hear him through our headsets. All raiders, this is lead. New information states that the facility has suffered mascal, situation break. Mascal means mass casualties. Enemy Op 4 unidentified. However, outgoing net during distress call indicates that Op 4 is extremely dangerous and engages at close range, break. There is no Blue 4 on site. I repeat, Main has stated there is no Blue 4 on site and we are to drop any and all packs we see. A few seconds passed as the captain looked back to the park ranger. Any additional comments, Ranger Clements? The man, maybe in his mid-forties, balding, he scratched the back of his neck, clearing his throat before speaking. I heard a lot of gunfire coming from down there, and don't split up. Whatever you do in these woods, don't split up. Ah, medic laughed. Well, that's just comforting. The captain nodded to the man as he held back in. Everyone watches sixes, twelves and fives. Let's go. We picked up and moved out. Everyone had their own kind of final moments type of readiness drill they did before they stepped onto the path into the woods. Same stuff we did, stepping off out of the FOBs and compounds back east. I let out one final breath of hot air in the cold. Our medic slapped the side of his helmet, hyping himself up. The captain pulled out and kissed a small crucifix necklace from underneath his combat shirt. We headed down the pathway, following the captain in a staggered column. Our IR lasers scanned the trees, rocks and foliage around us, looking desperately for any hostiles that lurked in the darkness. Though, to our paranoid readiness, nothing appeared. But, something was definitely following us. When we move through forest environments, you listen to the animals around you. The crickets, the birds, the movement of animals and what direction they're heading, how fast. Moving down that path, I couldn't hear a goddamn thing. It's common when you're a group of heavily armed green men moving through a forest at night that some of the squirrels and birds will run the hell away. But not the crickets or the bird songs in the distance. There's a certain level of ambience that animals will maintain, even if they detect humans around. There was none of that. Nothing. Not a cricket, a bird, a cicada. Nothing. Silent professionals. It's in our name. So, when I could hear a friendly ten meters ahead of me breathing as we moved through that dead forest, it told me that something else was here in the woods with us. A predator and that the forest was more afraid of it than us. After a long stretch of marching down the trail, the captain held a hand up, signalling a halt. As it got down to my part of the column, the middle section, he called over the radio. This is lead. On me. Time now. We quickly rushed up to what we saw was a metal chain link fence. Four of our weapon sergeants and the medic took up security covering the wood line behind us as I and the other remaining one went up to the gate with the captain. The bark's trail carried on for a few more meters before stopping dead into some trees. The dirt path broke off and formed a gravel one that led into a sectioned off area behind a chain link fence and gate. A ah, no trespasser sign hung high and just beyond the gate we could see a small guard shack. The captain tried to signal whoever might be in there by switching on the surefire attack light on his rifle, shining it and lasso waving it all over the booth. However, upon stopping and centering in the doorway, we saw a large amount of blood splashed on the back wall and pulled over the room, an arm laying halfway out the door frame. The captain looked to the other weapon sergeant with us. Get your kit. He nodded, slinging his rifle as he dropped his assault pack digging out a small pair of bolt cutters. Each of our weapon sergeants carried a different loadout depending on what we needed. One could be a gunner, another's a grenadier. I can't name him, but breechman, 
as I guess I'll call him, always carried a breech kit, just in case. He walked over to the lock, but just as he got the blades of the cutter around the lock, we heard it. It sounded like it came from everywhere, and yet far away at the same time. Maybe it was the echo of the forest, or maybe something attributed to its abilities. It sounded like a woman, yelling in pain, in agony, and yet the voice was half gargled, like it was morphed with that of a dying animal, as it had an underlying low tone pitch beneath it. It got under the skin of everyone. Those pulling security immediately jumped, scanning left, right, up and down. Hell, even the medic, big stocky dude, grew up in Brooklyn, played football before he joined, meaning he was as yoked as all hell when he got to our unit. The guy who once stuck his finger into a man's neck to plug his blood, looked around nervously. The hell was that? Our weapon sergeant with the M46 shook his head as he scanned the far off terrain, muttering in a low voice. Some horror movie nonsense right now. I remember holding my rifle's grip tight. Everyone was equally unnerved. Everyone. Except the captain. He just told us to press on. For goodness sake, loosen your jock straps. Let's go. He snapped the lock off. Immediately, the captain and I moved in and cleared the small booth as two more weapon sergeants and our medic took up covering down the gravel road. It was a guard. No name tape or company logo, decked out in a black plate carrier, the plate carrier of which had been torn into as a large hole covered the entire area of his solar plexus, which was now fragmented and broken inside of his mulched upper body. No bullet entry or exit wounds, just a large stab wound that looks like he got ran through by a damn lamppost. My breath still got caught in my throat as I grunted to clear it. The captain stepped out of the small booth, spitting hard into the grass, shaking his head. The medic prodded him. What was it like? He grunted, walking to the front of our formation. Doesn't matter, Doc. We formed up and moved down the gravel road in a wedge column. The captain and the three weapon sergeants in the front wedge, the medic, me, and two other weapon sergeants in the back one, the comm sergeant in the middle. We entered the facility lot. Immediately, the comm sergeant linked up with the captain, and I could hear him alerting Maine. This is Raider. Lead, we've reached the building. Though it makes me wonder, if he used the comm sergeant's radio to reach our HQ, who was he talking to on that other channel? The lot was clear, and we got a good look at the facility. It was a grey concrete rectangle, maybe the size of a small gas station. Floodlights mounted on the bottom illuminated the gravel lot up to the dense, shadowy wood line that laid just beyond the chain link fence. The wood line that was still quiet. The masculine carnage we were told about was present outside of the building. Several guards, all in various states of mutilation, similar to the gate guard, were strewn about the gravel lot. However, Unlike the gate guard, strangely, they were in heavier body armor, with rifles capable of going automatic and spin brass everywhere. Me and some of the other guys got on line and cleared out the back, exasperated breaths and muttering came from all of us. The captain chimed in. Raiders on me, time now. We hauled ass back to him as we stacked up at the door. Flowing in, we were greeted to a lobby torn up, furniture thrown everywhere, impact marks from rounds hitting the concrete lined walls and ceiling. One dead guard slumped against a red stained part of the wall, the other in a crumpled heap. A woman at the desk, not a guard, just a damn staff member sat back in a chair, her entire torso area torn apart. As we passed by her and headed through the double doors behind her, her empty, dead eyes met mine. The comm sergeant eyed her as well as we moved for the door. Sir, she was unarmed. I can see that. Keep chatter to a minimum.
we cleared through the double doors to be greeted by a porcelain hallway leading into a set of stairs heading to a sublevel. The entire surface, ceiling, walls, floor was lined with ceramic white tiles. Ceramic white tiles that were like the rest of the scene so far, stained with blood, guts, and even brain matter of the unlucky guards laid out all the way down the stairs. I counted eight. Seventeen so far. The flickering light could be seen through the wire glass windows of the double doors at the bottom. The captain ordered us to flow in through both sides. We did. Pushing in, we could see we entered into a T-style hallway. It gets a bit complicated here. Either end of the T ended, while the middle one shot forward far down into the hall leading into two reinforced blast doors at the very end. Two immediate labs on either side were reinforced with more wire glass, and despite several crates, impact marks, bullet holes, and even holes made in the glass, they held. This stuff can't be ballistic glass, our comm sergeant muttered. Why didn't they just take cover in there? The medic said. The captain sighed. Seems to be pointing to a surprise attack from the inside. Emphasis on surprise, jackass. The medic fired back. Well, sure, but it's just the door. While the hallways outside were a mess of blood, gore, guards thrown around, as they were ripped apart, creating a mess of bodies, weapons, and more spent brass. The lab techs had their white coats stained with their own blood. My blood, and I think everyone else's started to run cold as the pieces came together. Whatever killed them did so indiscriminately. We formed a rolling T heading into the hallway. I was on the right with the gunner taking center and another guy on the left. The captain pushed forward leading us from behind. The window labs ended halfway with two solid white doors near the double doors at the end on either side leading to closed off labs. The captain had us pull guard on both of the side doors as the gunner aimed back down the hallway. Everyone else took up security wherever it was needed. The captain eyed the door, feeling the cracks and lines of the blast door, looking for gaps that didn't exist. Blood had slowly leaked from the bottom causing him to pick up his boots and eye it. And yet, no openings existed. An electronic pad was positioned on the right side of the door. The captain eyed it. It was a hand scanner. I didn't even think those actually existed. He jumped on the private frequency I keep mentioning. I'm at the doors. Yeah, at the far end. There's a hand scanner. He waited a few seconds of deafening silence. He made an internal chuckle as he walked over to the dead body of a guard, kicking its arm. Got one right here. I'm sorry, repeat last? Alive? He rubbed his face, cursing under his breath. Damn. He shook his head, turning on the white light of his rifle and scanning the corpses. This place is a goddamn slaughterhouse. How am I going... A crash emanated from the white lab door to the right of the blast doors, the one I was covering. Everyone paused for a second as the second weapon sergeant aimed his laser at it. The captain turned his head, aiming his laser at the door as he approached. Might have one, or might have up four. Wait, one, over. The captain formed up as the first man in the stack. An unusual practice, but everyone else fell behind. I was the second man. Two more made third and fourth. A weapon sergeant felt the edges of the door, then tried the handle. Locked. Him trying the handle must have alerted whatever was inside, because a voice bellowed out. I... I'm in here. Please, I'll let you in. Just don't shoot. The doorman looked at the captain, who nodded. Might have blue four inside. Stay sharp. Wait on me to fire. There wasn't supposed to be any blue four on sight. The door's electronic lock opened. The doorman grabbed the handle and pulled it open as the four of us entered the room. We pushed through. The captain hooked left. I pushed forward. The other two followed one of us respectively. Our lasers entered the room and a pair of hands emerging from behind a lab table. 
please. The voice weakly shouted. The captain stormed over. Hands, now. I'll shoot you. I swear to God, if you don't put your goddamn hands up. As the person stood up, he saw the hands were connected to a scientist, possibly late thirties, stringy hair with circular glasses, glasses that flew off when the captain closed the distance, shoving him against a metal cabinet, spittle flying from the bearded mouth behind the NVGs as he barked at him. ID, where is it? Show it! The captain began roughly searching the lab tech as he pulled out his ID. He grabbed it, shoving him to the weapon sergeant on his side of the room. The lab tech was kicked down to his knees. The captain jumped back on the frequency. I'm back. Possible blue four. Prepare for ID code. He read it off in phonetics before he got the response. He looked to the weapon sergeant guarding the lab tech. Get his ass up. Please, I don't know what's going on. I was just running some chemical tests. We've got to get out of here before... The captain got in the man's face. Shut up. He did. You know what you've been doing. I know what you've been doing out here. Open them doors now. The man was shocked as the captain continued. Open the damn doors now. With a point from the captain, the weapon sergeant shoved the man forward into the door frame. The man crumbled a little bit as the captain laughed. Take your sweet time, doctor. Let's go. I picked him up by his shirt collar and dragged him over to the blast doors. The captain pushed him out of my grip, shoving his face into the door. Hand on the scanner. Now! As the captain grabbed the man by his wrist, the lab tech struggled to get free. Please, I don't have access. I hurt my hand trying to hide. Let me go. The medic winced at the sight a bit. Uncharacteristically of a green beret, especially for a jaded as hell medic, he spoke up. Cap, come on. The captain just turned, staring daggers into the man as he wrestled from the man's wrist. Just wait till you'll see. I'm telling you. As the man struggled against the captain, the weapon sergeant came up from behind, shoving the man into the blast door, allowing the captain to easily place it on the scanner. The scanner lit up in a bright blue as several lines traced and looked over his handprint. It then flashed green as the electronic lock of the blast doors began to open up. The captain dropped the man. Well, goodness gracious, what do you know? The doors slowly pulled open. The room was dark. Red flashing emergency lights flashed all around as the sound of broken glass scraped against the door. A stream of murky blue liquid mixed in with the blood of several guards' bodies that were revealed as the doorway leaked out into the hall. The captain grabbed the lab tech by the collar, dragging him to his feet. You all know these men, doctor. Friends? The captain shoved him through the doorway, the lab tech slipping on the fluids and glass cutting his right hand with a wince. We flowed in and... Jesus. I said this at the start. I've been all over. I've seen mass graves that terrorist cells have used in far off countries filled with entire villages worth of people. I've seen kill dens inside tunnel systems. This surpassed all of that. Every horror, every war crime, multiple times over. A series of glass tubes lined the walls. Walls made out of monitors, hard drives, and computer systems. The path of carnage led through the pile of guards at the doorway. That makes 24 armed personnel that were taken out by something. What really bothered me was that in those murky, green and blue glass tubes, as big as a refrigerator, connected to a port at the top and bottom, tubes and wires inside connecting to... The captain shoved the lab tech into a glass tube. The pop of the man's nose echoed off the empty area as he grabbed his nose. Well, Doc, which one was it? Which goddamn tube? Tube? What was he talking about? How did he know? Who was on the frequency? The lab tech spit out blood, leaking into his mouth as the captain, standing at six foot five, a giant, even amongst his team, brawny SOF operators, picked him up by his collar of his blue undershirt. I don't... 
two weapon sergeants ducked out of the way as the captain got in his face, shoving him against the left side wall, causing the monitors and computer systems to beep and light up. Oh, you don't know, and yet your little hand opens the room that you didn't have access to, he roared, abandoning all silence and discretion now as the man began to sputter and sob. Please, please, I... The captain gritted his teeth. He quickly flipped up his nods and stared daggers into the man's soul. How many people did you snatch off that trail? How many? What kind of butchering you do to those kids before you stuck them in there? Which one escaped? Kids. Butchering. Something in my mind stopped, and I switched on my rifle's tack light. A heavy pit in my stomach formed as I flashed it on the tubes. There were people in those tubes. They were people. Wire and tubes now poked into see-through and murky flesh as the bodies of the kidnapped floated, mutated, dissected, and changed. One person's skin ran reptilian-like up their left arm, before merging with a strange gaping hole in their chest, their skull protruding out of their skin in their head. My breathing stuttered a bit as I backed up a few steps, glass crunching under my boots, curses muttered by the others in the room as we all began to look. Another one's mouth was sealed at the front, two more jagged, messed up sets of teeth poked out either side. Their eyes were sealed, skin covering defined sockets in their head. The medic flashed his on one where their spine stuck out through their back. The vertebrae was larger than a normal person's, the bones sticking out inches longer in some areas. Jesus, man, this is... He gagged a bit, coughing as he looked away. I had to pry my eyes away. My mind was frying just looking at... They better be dead. Oh, I swear to the Lord himself if they ain't. The captain said sternly as the man sobbed and nodded. Y yes. The captain raised an eyebrow. You sure? Yes, they died during surgery. If you're lying to me, I swear to God, I will make you euthanize every single one. The captain shoved the lab tech forward into the center of the aisle. I looked down, shaking my head as the images of those things burned into the film of my brain. Where's she gone, doctor? The captain said, sternly, squaring up to the man, who sobbed as he shrugged. I... I... Where is it? The man continued to cry. He escaped. He killed everyone. He cut through the guards. He cut through everyone. All of my friends. This caused the captain to nearly bust a blood vessel from the look he gave him, balling up his fist and driving the arm and knuckle of his ugly glove into the gut of the lab tech. This caused the smaller, weaker lab tech to buckle over dropping to his hands and knees, now favoring an injured hand and probably a burst spleen. Your friends? Your friends? You mean the friends that kidnapped a 22-year-old girl and a 14-year-old son and turned them into monsters? What about them? This earned only more sobs from the lab tech as the captain turned, hands on his hips as he scoffed. He looked at the medic, who only stared back through his nods. The captain turned to look at him. You got to the count of ten, and if you don't give me a single whereabouts of this thing, I will start grabbing tools and cutting your little Weasley ass up like you did to these kids. The captain loomed over the man, grabbing him by his hair. Sir, sir, please, the lab tech pleaded. One, two, three. The captain counted. Some looked away. Others shook their heads. There wasn't a man in the room who wouldn't do what he did right now after seeing... them. It's... it's in the woods. You heard it. It did its... freaky yell just like ten minutes ago. The captain laughed, letting go of the man's hair as he whipped his head forward. Y'all hear that? It's in the woods. He pulled out his M17, his 9mm sidearm pulling the slide back a bit to make sure it was chambered. Four. Five. Six. 
the man stood up, and at this point, I kicked out his extended leg, dropping him back to his knees. The man looked at me, then at the captain. You can't do this. This is illegal. Before the captain could finish his count, we heard it. It echoed all the way down the facility halls, reverberating off the glass tubes in the room. That half-feminine, half-monstrous cry. Except this time, it didn't come from far-off mountains or trees. It came from the stairs. Then the lights went out. I don't know if it was prior damage to the facility or electric works or something else, but they zapped out. The lights in the halls, the lights in the stairs, the lights in the room, the electronics, the lights in the tanks, all of it. He cried out again, and this time, I think I heard it say, help me. Anyone who had their nods up flicked them down. All of us trained our lasers down the dark hall beyond the door. The slight shakiness of all the green lasers told the same stories. All of the death, all of the stuff in the tanks, it had everyone spooked. The captain came up alongside me, and the medic, he looked back to the lab tech. You run, you die. The man swallowed and smothered his misery. I... I know. The captain corrected him in a low tone. No, you really don't. The creature cried out again. Help me. The sounds of something hard impacting the tile floor sounded out as it approached us through the dark abyss. More footsteps, then another cry. Help me. The gunner let out a shaky breath as he cracked his neck. More footsteps, then another cry. Help me. It was maybe five meters from the door now. Lord Almighty, the captain muttered. I couldn't see much in that darkness then, but I saw what everyone else saw. I saw enough. Its body was easily six feet tall. Two gigantic, bony, mantis-like legs that were dark from blood stepped into the doorway. Its head was smooth, its large teeth shining in the darkness, and its eyes glowed like an animal. Its eyes glowed. He could see us. We all froze. We had rifles trained on it, a damn machine gun trained on it, a room full of green berets, the best of the best, and everyone froze. The captain was first to fire, slamming his trigger as he shot 223 death into that crime against existence. The gunner opened up as well, and then the medic. Two more weapon sergeants also shot. It yelled at us, cried out like an agonized woman pleading for help. Then, it lunged. Running and slamming through a test tube, glass flew everywhere, causing several of us to shield our faces as the water flooded the floor, and the deformed body that was inside flopped down near our feet. A horrendous, rotted smell filled the air. Jesus! The medic spotted out, gagging a bit as he kicked it away. The creature now screamed. As a rifleman that it jumped near backed up, it leapt on top of him, shoving that bony mandible into his left shoulder, pinning him to the ground as he screamed, thrashing his elbow into the thing as he kicked its stomach. But it didn't attack him. It just eyed the scientist. He attempted to run for his life, but the thing jumped on top of him, pinning him face first into the murky wet floor. That's when I noticed the six smaller human-like arms on its torso. Its main mandible pinned him to the ground, the arms, some normal, some with bony spikes for fingers, others just lined with sharp teeth began to rip into the man's back. The lab tech screamed, his lab coat was torn open as he began to dig down into his back. Some still fired shots, but it didn't even react, it didn't even move. 
just continued to tear into that vile but poor son of a gun. The captain's voice lit up the comms as he and the medic rushed to pick the man up and heave him on the captain's shoulders. We can't engage him here, outside, now. He was right. It thrived on close quarters. It ran guys through before they could pick it apart. We all ran, nerves shot, weapons hot from firing into a thing that didn't react. The power off so we couldn't close the blast doors. All we could do was run. I nearly slipped on the glass as we booked it out of there, firing some desperate pot shots into the lab with a gunner. The lab tech screams echoed throughout the hallway as we booked it up the stairs. It was going to be done with him soon. The gunner and I covered the captain as we broke out into the open air, the smell of rotten death replaced by the open piney air of the forest. Several men broke out road flares, tossing them everywhere, giving us much needed light in the form of greens, blues, reds and purples. The captain dropped the man behind a beaten up and wrecked sedan as the medic began to patch him up. The gunner deployed his bipod and aimed at the doors of the facility from the car's hood. The captain positioned different men to where they could all fire on the door, far enough away from the thing's grasp. Romero, get on that damn net and call in that air! I took aim behind a large SUV with several others. We all aimed at the door. The screaming had stopped. The silence was broken by its bony mandibles as it rushed out into the open air, and with all the flares and chem lights and even the captain's tack light, we finally got a good look. Its skin was a mix between pink from its exposed muscles to a see-through clear layer covering other parts. Bony, calcium-like armor had formed over a lot of its body, and its back to legs formed smaller, mandible-like features at the back, and its head an exposed skull, all to human eyes, peering out in a rage as its larger, unhinged jaw opened and it roared out its deafening cry at us. The gunner was the first to open up. A blast of 556 tore through the armor on its mandible legs and torso. The thing recalled at first and then hissed as it charged forward. The captain ran from his place in front of the sedan's side. The thing stuck its two large mandibles into the roof badly denting it. The medic quickly covered the wounded weapon sergeant, shielding him as the thing peered down at the two. The captain quickly got his attention, aiming fire at the back of its head. It roared with a vengeance as it charged at the captain. He fell back to the sedan, running out of our line of fire as the thing barreled towards us. The thing stuck a mandible inside the hood, impaling it, and then another just to my left. I circled around and behind it as I fired. It cried out, blood now pouring from its wounds as its calcium plating was cracked and falling off in mass. The thing turned to me, and as I flicked my M4 to Auto and laid into it, it just barreled at me, shoving me to the ground. Its smaller, demonic hands reached for me as I kicked them away. Its jaw snapped as I held my rifle in the way, shielding my face as it gnawed on the metal. The gunner then blasted a chunk of its exposed skull away staggering it as it turned. The captain whipped his stock into the thing's head, then backpedaled as he fired off another burst of rounds. The thing turned at him, roaring viciously as the captain dropped his empty mag. He slapped in a fresh one as the thing lunged at him, both mandibles raised. The glass exploded out of the SUV's windows as the captain dropped levels, firing into its stomach as he circled out back into the open. The creature roared as it went to move for him again, but it couldn't. Its large mandibles were stuck all the way inside of the vehicle. The captain let his rifle hang slung on his front as he reached for something in his kit. An M67 fragmentation grenade. Get back! Everyone who was in the open ducked for cover. The gunner and several weapon sergeants retreated behind a series of concrete jersey barriers. I ran and slid behind the sedan, helping the medic to shield our wounded battle buddy. I heard the distinct sound of a spoon flying and the whistling of the grenade. The captain vaulted himself over the car hood with the comm sergeant, covering his radio operator's head as they both went prone. The explosion was thunderous, 
The shockwave of the grenade shook everyone and even rattled me a bit from being so close. Shrapnel and fragments flew everywhere, impacting the concrete barriers, the building, any windows in the sedan that weren't already broken were shattered. A few seconds passed as we all hesitantly started to lift our heads, then dropped them as the SUV's gas tank seemingly erupted and detonated, engulfing the wreck in a fireball so large it felt like the flames were touching my face. The captain popped up, aiming on top of the hood of the car. Then I and several others joined him, peeking from behind our point of cover as we looked to see if that had done it. The SUV was a burning skeleton, an inferno from all of the ignited gasoline covering the frame and the ground around it, and the beast as it defiantly pulled its last remaining mandible, its front left one, the only appendage it had left, and stumbled out from the flames. Its skin popped, its muscles boiled, and with all of the see-through skin and bone plating torn and burnt off, it gazed around. Its eyes ruptured and melted. Help me. The gravel crunched as its charred and still burning body slumped forward. The captain emerged from behind the Vic as only a few of us dared to approach the thing. He lifted his nods, this time pulling his M17 back up and aiming at the thing's head. Three shots into the thing's head. The damaged and charred skull caving in. A circle of light illuminated us as the rotary blades of the Black Hawk sounded out overhead. I shouldered my face and lifted my nodes to avoid the spotlight blinding me. Up four, actual down, building secure. The ensuing hour was one that was just shrouded in, I don't know, mystery I guess. The captain went against prior missions of telling us to go prone and pull security, putting the gunner at the sedan by the gate and telling the rest of us to watch the wood line. When the van showed up, that's when he told us to chill out. They weren't really vans, they were more like armoured trucks. Now, for the sake of being classified and remaining anonymous, I can't divulge a lot about them. I'm definitely not saying the black shirts were wearing black multicam combat uniforms with kits, weapons and gear available that would definitely make them a private sector group. I'm not saying their uniforms were sterilised with all patches, logos and markers stripped. I'm also not saying the hazmat suits looked way beyond anything our MOPE system has. I'm not saying they brought several metal cases in from their armoured vics and I'm not saying they brought in advanced surveillance drones with them. I will say, they weren't really hostile. Damn, one even offered us a cigarette. The bird landed at the opposite side of the building, the open lot where they eventually told us to head. We prepared our guy for case vac on a litter with a black hawk and loaded up as the captain finished talking to some guy in a suit. He was much shorter, maybe 5'8". He bore the look of a younger but still weathered man. His hair was slicked back and had a hard part. A slight bump underneath his sports coat told me he was armed. The captain eventually joined us as soon as the aviation crew shut the door. He popped his helmet off, much to their anger, and slumped back in his seat. When we touched base and got back to the COP, our sister team, Artemis, replaced us on QRF. I've been thinking about this for days now about what those people did to them in that lab, what the captain said. They kidnapped them, cut them up, changed them. All for what? Some sick fantasy? Who even owned the lab? There were no US markings, no logos, zip. Like I said before, there's still a lot I don't know, but what I do know is that those guys got exactly what they deserved. That thing, crying out for help, pleading for us to make its suffering end. The more I think about it, the more it makes me sick. I don't know who the hell those guys were that relieved us, but they didn't have any markings. Some of them were speaking German, if my memory serves. But whoever they are, 
I hope they learn from their mistakes and never tamper with that evil again. Even though we lived in the projects, and even though it was just the two of us, my mum had to work constantly just to feed us. There was rent, bills, food, medical and credit card debt. She had a whole host of financial responsibilities that seemed to overshadow bonding time with her daughter. Which, even as a kid, I understood. I learned, at a very young age, that the world revolves around money, and, without money, you're going to end up on the worst end of things. That's how we ended up homeless and living with my aunt before we settled into pinnacle homes. And that's what she was trying to keep from happening ever again. Childcare wasn't really an option. It was too rich for our blood and it was assumed I would be able to take care of myself by the age of eight. Maybe this is an anomaly for poor neighborhoods, but my routine was to be my own parent. I'd wake up, grab my lanyard with a key, put myself on the bus, take myself off the bus, do homework, fix dinner, clean a little and go to bed. If mum worked a double, which she often did between the two jobs, it'd seem like days before I'd see her. The only real parental structure I had was a list of rules on yellow legal paper that mum would stick to the fridge every morning before she bolted off to her first job. Typically, the rules would stay the same, unless I messed something up that mom needed to address, like not cleaning the kitchen after I cooked. But sometimes, she'd make a new list with goofy little things written on them to try and make my day a little brighter. Nestled between, don't stay out past seven, and no long distance calls, would be something dumb like, don't put coins in your ears, or don't let fish swim backwards on Sundays. Most of them were pulled from dumb American laws she'd read about in one of her checkout line tabloids, but they gave me a giggle all the same. Then one day, I think I was maybe nine, I came home from school and checked the list. It was a new sheet of paper and a new colour of pen, so I was expecting something silly to be waiting for me. Her handwriting was rushed and lopsided, and most of it was exactly the same as the previous bunch of rules. The one exception was the joke rule, which didn't seem very funny. Don't talk to the new neighbor. I didn't get it. I also figured that maybe, judging from how horrid the handwriting looked, that she was in a rush, about to be late, and just bombed the delivery. After all, it had to be a joke of some kind since I hadn't seen anyone new in the neighborhood. If we indeed had a new neighbor, I was pretty sure I'd catch wind of them or moving trucks or something when I went to and from the bus stop. I didn't think anything of it. I went about my normal routine. Mom worked late and came home after I went to bed, then slept straight through my alarm the next morning when I got up for school. We never crossed paths for me to ask for clarification, so I gave myself closure by checking the apartment to the left of us on my way out. I looked through the window and found it empty. Maybe that was the joke. Regardless, the weird note ended up forgotten somewhere in the middle of math lesson to make room for multiplication tables. A couple of days went by, and then, on my way back from the bus stop, I saw somebody on the sidewalk in front of our building that I'd never seen before. New faces in the projects aren't too strange since people are in and out all the time but she stuck out like a sore thumb. Platinum blonde hair, bright scrubs, groceries in a paper bag tucked under her arm. She was young and didn't seem like she had any kids or anything. Definitely not the type of person that would qualify for Section 8. When she saw me coming out of the corner of her eye, she turned to me and turned on a smile that was better fit for a Colgate commercial. It caught me so off guard that it stopped me. She was slender and pretty, like the models in mum's magazines, with hot pink lipstick and stunning blue eyes. Not an ounce of her looked like it belonged. Oh, hello. Her voice sparkled as much as a smile. 
Nice day today, isn't it? Or something to that effect. I don't remember exactly what she said, aside from the fact it was an attempt at small talk. And kids suck at small talk. Especially me. I stumbled over an answer, but managed to say something all the same, which was enough to please her. Her smile dissolved into a clueless expression soon after as her eyes scanned the numbers above the stoops, looking for an address. As I watched her, it never occurred to me she could be the new neighbor. She was dressed like a nurse, carrying groceries, and was a lot more put together than the people on my end of the road, me included. What I did figure was that she must have been a home health employee. Living to the right of us was an elderly woman named Miss Dorothy, who went through in-home nurses like most of us go through tissues. She was probably looking for her apartment, or was intentionally dragging her feet, since Miss Dorothy likely had a reputation for not being the most pleasant of people. I slipped past and trudged on home, right by the empty apartment where the lady was standing. I pulled out my lanyard and unlocked the door, and as soon as the lock clicked, I noticed she was staring at me. She looked concerned. Heck, she looked horrified. Do you live here? She asked. I smiled awkwardly. Is your mom home? She demanded. I shook my head. Yeah, this was definitely not somebody who lived here. Nobody questioned latchkey kids in our neighborhood. You're alone? The fact she sounded so aghast made me a little afraid. Mom had always worried that somebody would report her to CPS for negligence one day, even though I was perfectly capable of taking care of myself. My heart sank. I think it showed in my face. Oh, honey, no. Don't look at me like that. Just, if you need anything, let me know, okay? Okay, I whimpered. I'll be right next door, okay? My name is April. I nodded and went inside. I didn't check if April ever found a way to Miss Dorothy. Days went by and CBS didn't come pounding on our door, so I figured April must have kept her mouth shut. We did cross paths pretty frequently though, since Miss Dorothy seemed to run April like she'd never run a nurse before. Whenever I come back home from school, April would be trudging down the sidewalk with bags from the Dollar General and when I'd go outside to play, she'd be heading to a car. If I ran an errand to the corner store, April would usually be there too, buying cat food and milk, and maybe a sandwich from the deli. Sometimes, if she was feeling generous and wasn't in much of a hurry, she'd buy me a sandwich too. If nothing else, we'd walk and talk at the same time. She told me my mom should think about getting a CNA license and told me that I was remarkable for such a young kid. In fact, she lavished me with praise, like she was shocked by the notion that precocious children existed. Then, one day, the list of rules in the fridge changed again. All of them were mundane, except one, written, bolded and underlined. Stay away from the new neighbor. Again, what new neighbor? On my way to school, I once again checked the empty apartment next to us. I got up on my tiptoes and looked in the window, and sure enough, it was completely abandoned. Maybe mom was pulling a long con on me to see how confused I could get before she'd give up and tell me it was a prank. I quickly forgot it and continued to pass my days making conversation with April, both when I'd leave for school and when I'd come trudging back home. Sometimes I'd just sit out on my stoop and we'd chat, usually about me and how I was faring. Very, very sparingly, she'd tell me about herself, but only insofar as her job was concerned. It was rare that she'd accidentally let slip a few details about her personal life, like how her boyfriend left her, how she moved into a new apartment, and that she had some nondescript pet named Jade. I didn't know if Jade was a dog or a cat, but I guess cat, based on the pet food she'd buy at the corner store. 
Time ticked on. The note on the fridge never changed, barring the orders to not talk to the neighbor being circled a couple more times. I didn't bother to ask mom about it the few times I'd seen her, seeing as I'd written it off as a bad prank by that point. She never brought it up either, so it seemed like the whole thing was dead in the water. Spring break sprang up on us, and even though I usually got to see mom a little more often during school breaks, she picked up a third job to help fund my birthday gift. It happened occasionally. She had a habit of worrying about me feeling left out and would pick up extra work to get me something, quote, all of the other kids had. That year, it was an N64, which, while exciting, also meant I would be completely alone for the week. No friends, no school, no mom. Just seven whole days of seeing her only if we got up to pee at the same time during the night. I was mostly a hermit, so I didn't see April much either. It was too rainy to go play outside for half the week, and it was too much effort to get up off the couch beyond that. The only time I saw her was after a few days of silence, when there was a knock on the door. It took me by surprise. We never had visitors, but a quick glimpse through the peephole eased my fears. She had a bin of clothes tucked under her arm. Her hair was a little disheveled. She asked if I was okay and if I was enjoying my break, then explained that the washer and dryer next door had spontaneously stopped working. The laundry desperately needed done. Not an exaggeration. I could smell it from where I stood, and she wanted to know if she could come in and use ours real quick. Sure. Why not? I was supposed to avoid the imaginary new neighbor, not Miss Dorothy's home health nurse. I offered to help her load everything, or to even do it for her. Both times, she told me no, but she didn't begrudge me standing behind her while she dumped everything into the washer. She didn't bother to sort, and I figured it had something to do with her limited time, the overpowering smell of something fetid, and the brown smears all over everything. My stomach turned, but I figured maybe Miss Dorothy had an accident. After all, if I learned anything from television, it was that old people needed diapers. April stuck around for a few minutes, just long enough to marvel at how clean I kept the place. But the longer she lingered, the more uneasy I became. I don't know why, but there was just something jarring about someone being in the apartment while Mom wasn't there. It slowly dawned on me, I didn't really know this woman at all, and she was being awfully curious about everything, prodding around like she was looking for a sign of weakness. My first instinct was that she was looking for a definitive reason to call CPS, but even that didn't feel wholly right. I just felt... uncomfortable. So, I told her I wasn't supposed to let strangers in the house, and nervously, passive-aggressively implied she should leave. She was fine with it, but on her way past the kitchen to the front door, she caught a glimpse of the note Mom wrote me. Her brows furrowed and her nose crinkled, but despite the look of disgust, she laughed. I knew she probably saw the part about not talking to the new neighbor first, given how it was circled and underlined. Maybe she thought mom was overprotective. As soon as she walked out the door, I closed it, locked the chain, and told her through the gap that I'd put everything in the dryer and bring it to her once it was done. I also begged her not to tell my mom I let her in. I didn't really give her an opportunity to answer before I closed the door, locked the locks, and decided to meditate in front of the television. But I was a kid of my word. Right as my nerves began to settle in the warm embrace of an afternoon of Nicktoons, the buzz of the washer went off. Then, an hour later, the dryer. It took a strange amount of courage to pick up the laundry bin once everything was folded and fresh. But I was committed to being a responsible kid and told April I'd bring everything to her. I grabbed the laundry, my lanyard, locked the door on my way out and walked a whole two yards to Miss Dorothy's. I knocked. No answer. Maybe April was at the corner store. I looked around, waited a few minutes, 
then knocked again with the same result. Annoyed, I pounded a little harder, on the verge of calling for April herself, when I heard the chain scratching against the other side. The door opened, and a man stood in the doorway. He was tall, stubbly, in powder blue scrubs. He was holding a syringe, like I'd interrupted something. At first, he looked angry, then confused, then worried when he noticed that I was just as bewildered as him. If I squinted into the dark behind him, I could see Miss Dorothy in a living room, seated in a recliner. She glared at me. Nobody knew why there was some idiot kid standing on their stoop with a bunch of clothes. When I asked for April, he seemed lost. I tried to explain that April was Miss Dorothy's home health nurse, and he replied that he was Miss Dorothy's home health nurse and had been for over a month. No, there wasn't anyone named April who covered for him on his days off, and no, nobody had been by Miss Dorothy's apartment except him that day. The more I pressed, the more concerned he seemed to get. After taking a moment to ditch the needle, he came back to ask for more details. What did she look like? Where did I meet her? Was there anyone else in the neighborhood who may have had in-home care? I blinked tears of embarrassment out of my eyes as I answered. He told me he wished he could be of more help before apologizing and closing the door. I trundled away, laundry in hand. Embarrassment became fear. I kept thinking back to how odd I felt while April was in the apartment, and my heart beat faster. When we first met, she said if I needed anything, she'd be right next door. But one apartment was empty, and she didn't work for Miss Dorothy after all. Faster still, April was just some stranger, and everything she told me seemed to be lies. But what was she getting out of lying to some kid? I walked straight past my apartment to the vacant one next door, and, climbing up on my tiptoes, peeked in the window yet again. Empty. It was still empty. I left the laundry on the stoop anyway, and sprinted back home. I locked the doors, I locked the windows, I ran up to my bedroom and locked myself in. To add one more layer of security between me and April, I climbed into my closet and pulled it shut. And there I stayed, vowing not to move until mom came home from work. There was a part of me who was convinced April was some kind of ghost and that the evening would end like a horror movie. A more sensible part of my brain tried to justify things however it could. When my mom and I first moved into the projects, we didn't have any furniture and I just slept on blankets in the floor. So maybe April was just rebounding from a bit of bad luck. It was also possible that the first day we met, she misspoke and she actually lived two apartments away, maybe three. Maybe saying she was right next door was meant figuratively and not literally. After what felt like an eternity of waiting, I started hearing knocking from downstairs. On the door, on the windows, and I swear, it was creeping closer. The walls were thin in certain places, so I kept trying to figure out if the footsteps I was hearing on the stairs were in my apartment or Miss Dorothy's, or if the banging I was hearing on the walls was maintenance working in the vacant apartment or somebody trying to flush me out. I curled up in a ball and held my breath, sitting on the floor of my closet and rationalizing my fears, until I heard something in my room. Not a person, not a banging sound, not even a voice. There was someone jostling the doorknob quietly, which I almost convinced myself was me accidentally knocking into something, and then a quieter noise. It was the sound of paper being slid under a door. My closet had slats, so if I angled my head correctly, I could actually see some of the notes on my bedroom floor. It was on yellow legal paper, just like my mom's notes. Maybe it was mom. As quietly as I could, I slid the closet door open and silently slipped out to fetch it. It was written in horrid scrolls and looked like mom's rushed writing. But it wasn't a list. 
It was just a word. Hello. I froze as I realized that I felt like I was being watched and that the gap beneath my door was high enough to look into the room. The idea that the note had been bait flashed in my mind as I pressed my head down on the floor and worked up the courage to look under the door and into the hallway, right dead into the sparkling blue eye of April. I could even see the corner of a smile, bright and white and ready for Aquafresh prime time. My gazes met, her eyes widened like a cat about to pounce. She pushed the weight into the door. Gotcha, sweetie. I screamed and pounded against the wall between mine and Miss Dorothy's apartment, wailing and shrieking. I stomped and yelled and fumbled for anything heavy enough to do some damage. As I heard April putting all of her weight on a door that I was sure wouldn't hold, I threw open my window and shrieked into the ether for help. April, silent, kept throwing herself at the barrier between us. When I heard the first snap, I took a look down from the window and to the roof over our stoop. It was small, slanted, and too far away to be a safe jump but it was still safer than launching myself all the way down to the concrete. Without overthinking it, I pulled myself out into the evening air, tumbled down and clasped to whatever I could to keep myself from rolling the rest of the way down. The shingles were rough, like asphalt, and I felt the road burn forming on my shoulder. I felt something snap in one of my wrists, but adrenaline is a hell of a thing when you think you're about to be murdered. I didn't see April leave, as distracted as I was trying not to fall. I just balanced the best I could where I was, and wailed and cried and screamed until Miss Dorothy's actual nurse burst out of the apartment. He tried desperately to calm me down, telling me he called the police as soon as I started yelling and promising he'd find a way to get me down. He tried to calm me enough that I'd tell him where my mum worked so he could call her too but I couldn't stop hyperventilating long enough to speak. The next few days were a blur. Somehow, my mom got away with leaving me at home by myself, and I think it may have been the home health nurse's doing. I remember people asking a lot of questions, but I really didn't know anything about April aside from what she looked like and the fact she had been dumped and had a pet named Jade. Faces started blending together, time became meaningless, and I remember more about going to a kindly child's therapist after all was said and done than I remember the actual outcome. It's like everything was blotted painlessly out of my mind before I reached adulthood. This would normally be where the story concludes, an anticlimactic end with no resolution. There wouldn't really be a reason to tell it, at least not on this grand of a scale. Hell, I probably wouldn't have even remembered to talk about it, period if not for my mom. She had a very close call with ovarian cancer this past year, which loosened the lips about quite a few old stories about when she was a kid, I was a kid, or weird things about our family. Maybe it's her attempt to bring closure to us both. Either way, it's the reason that, a propos of nothing, she nonchalantly asked me if I remembered April the other day. Apparently, I didn't recall a lot of the aftermath because mom specifically went out of her way to keep me from finding out about it. She knew I wouldn't be thrilled with the fact that April was never caught, for instance. She had made a beeline out of the back door while everyone was distracted and never came back. She also guessed I wouldn't have taken it well if I'd known the notes, including the neighbor rule, didn't come from her. She'd actually stopped rewriting the rules because she figured I knew them well enough, so the notes had probably been written by April. The police investigation found that April had been letting herself in for a while, courtesy of a fault in a window that maintenance apparently knew about and never disclosed. Even if you locked it, it would be open. So, during the night, she would sneak in, going through our stuff, potentially leaving notes, Nobody is sure what the notes were supposed to accomplish, but they're pretty sure 
it was a part of some kind of grooming attempt or scare tactic. Or maybe she was just crazy and they had no purpose. That's mom's theory. Additionally, the empty apartment next to us wasn't empty at all. According to the housing authority's records, as well as the rumor mill and the local news, it was rented out to somebody named April Gallant, who police figured out pretty quickly didn't actually exist. This woman managed to get into state housing using an assumed name and fake information, and even claimed to have a daughter. Mom never found out who the daughter was, but she had her suspicions. You see, when they inspected the apartment, behind a locked door in an unfinished upstairs bedroom, they found the remains of a little girl around my age. She hadn't been dead long, probably shortly after April allegedly moved in, but she seemed to have been beaten in the past and was so malnourished that she was basically a skeleton. Dark skin, dark hair, she definitely didn't seem like somebody who'd be related to a blonde, blue-eyed girl. And after what happened with me, they concluded that the girl had been a victim of abduction. They looked for anything they could that would help with identification. But the only thing they found in the room with her was an empty bowl, cans of dried up cat food, and a collar with tags hanging on the closet. Unsurprisingly, the collar was their best lead. They're still looking for anyone. Missing a child named Jade. I sure did pick a hell of a time to move into this house. My back itches and there's a sore on the inside of my nostril and it feels hot in my throat every time I breathe in through my nose. I'm not sick with anything, at least not anything you may have heard about on the television, but I'm pretty sure I'm sick with something. It all started back when I moved into my first house ever. I was excited. It was a new stage of my life, going from living in an apartment for five years to finally having something with a damned backyard. The American dream was finally mine, but no one told me how much yard work was involved in keeping that dream nice and tidy. The backyard was simple and square with a nice layer of grass and surrounding the perimeter was a fairly tall hedge, almost a foot taller than me. When I got in close to it, my first evening staying in the house with a beer in hand and a good vibe in mind, I noticed how unkempt the hedge was. There were twigs hanging out here and there and it was nowhere near flat. It wouldn't do, I had told myself, in between sips of a beer that was beginning to grow warm thanks to the tepid Texan weather. I made plans to go to Home Depot and get a hedge trimmer after finding out that they weren't really all that expensive. When I woke up in the morning, I noticed that there were strange leaves under my bed. That should have been my first clue that things were not right with the house, but I just figured maybe the wind had blown some leaves into my shirt without me noticing but deep down, I knew that I had changed clothes entirely before laying down for sleep. But whatever. You don't really notice the small details all that much when your head is in the clouds, do you? I waited until the evening to test out my hedge trimmer, after watching a couple YouTube tutorial videos on how to best shape a hedge. A couple beers later, and I cranked that thing up and got to work on the hedge, starting at one side of the yard and working my way around. It was a lot more enjoyable than I imagined it would be. The vibrations of the hedge trimmer in my hands made me feel powerful, as if I were Thor himself wielding Mjolnir, brimming with energy. I was thinking about Thor throwing lightning bolts when sparks flew into my eyes. I thought that maybe Thor himself had felt me thinking about him and decided to prank me with a bolt of my own. I had screamed and threw down the hedge trimmer, thankfully not hitting my feet, and fell backwards onto my ass. I scooted back, the sparks still burned into the back of my retina, making it hard to see anything around me. After a few moments, my vision cleared. I got myself back up and turned off the hedge trimmer that had been idling in the grass and went over to the hedge to examine what in the hell had happened. Turns out, 
there was a damn statue in the middle of the hedge. That's right, a full marble statue. And after clearing some of the hedge away, I could see that it was a statue of a man, standing there, fully nude, junk and all, just planted there in the midst of twigs and bramble. I looked closely and saw that the hedge had grown around him, looping branches around his arms and torso and legs. What the hell are you doing in there? I'd asked. I started to reach into the hedge to see if maybe I could pull him out, but immediately got a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, as if reaching into the hedge would be the very last thing on this earthly plane I would do. I jumped back, the feral part of my mind telling me that there were snakes in the hedge. No, something poisonous. No, there's nothing in there. But there's probably something that will hurt you in there. But it was just a hedge. Surely, there's nothing in there that could hurt me. It had already been getting late, and the goosebumps on the back of my neck were telling me to just get inside and lock the doors. I told myself that I was just spooked from the sparks and all. That was it. But I'd later come to find out that there would be more to it. The next morning, I decided that I would use the head trimmer to cut around the statue, clearing the hedge away from the granite man. I didn't care if it meant there would be an odd hole in the hedge. Something inside me told me that I just need to get him out of there. I brought the hedge trimmer out from the garage and walked over to the hedge, feeling tension building in my arms, and right before I turned on the hedge trimmer, I noticed that the statue was no longer there. What the hell? I knew it had to have been in this particular spot because this is where I'd stopped hedging that yesterday evening. But sure enough, it wasn't there. Just to be sure, I walked the perimeter of the hedge, occasionally jabbing the hedge trimmer into the denser portions of the hedge just to make sure. When I completed my search without finding anything, I'll admit, a part of me sort of cracked. I didn't feel like finishing the rest of the hedge. I put the trimmer back in the garage and went back into the house and mixed myself a drink. I walked around the house with drink in hand, stopping occasionally at several boxes here and there to attempt to unpack. But I didn't really have it in me. I was bothered, I'll admit. And that night, when it had gotten dark, I went to the window in the living room looking out to the backyard and I stood there looking out into the hedge. It was too dark to tell for certain but looking back out at the spot where the statue had originally been I could make out a silhouette of someone standing among the bramble. I put my drink down and cupped my hands around my eyes and pressed up against the glass so I could see clearer and sure enough well, almost sure enough, I thought I could see the statue there in the hedge. The drinks I'd poured myself had granted me some kind of otherworldly courage, because at that moment, I said screw it, and I walked out there in the dark to confront the statue. My plan was to just grab the damn thing and pull it with all my might so that it would tip into the yard. That way, I knew for sure that damn thing would not be moving anywhere. I felt my courage slowly waning as I approached the hedge, that sense of leaving this world behind building up in my esophagus like steaming bile. But the boo's courage prevailed. I approached the hedge, standing a foot away from the man in there, and I reached into the bramble, and something grabbed me back and pulled. I yelped as I fell into the hedge the bramble scraping at my face and eyes and my arms and back, and I fell through the hedge, expecting to be pulled into the embrace of the statue. But instead, I fell face first into dirt. Disoriented, I pushed myself up from the dirt, feeling pebbles digging their way into the palms of my hands and stones digging into my knees. I looked around, needing some moments for my eyes to adjust to the low light. To my left was a hedge wall, and to my right, another. Behind me was a dead end, and ahead of me was a path. I was in a hedge maze. I am not messing around with this, no, I said aloud, 
with my head buzzing. I turned around where I'd fallen through and approached the dead end, getting near the bush and getting ready to push my way through back to my own backyard. I stuck one hand out ahead of me and sunk it into the hedge, and I recoiled. A searing pain pierced my palm and radiated up my arm. It nearly knocked me from my feet. The pain was so excruciating. I turned my hand over and saw that there was a thorn lodged into my palm. I yanked it out, which seemed to ease the pain just a little bit, but was surprised to see just how deep it had gone. I looked back at the hedge and finally noticed that here on this side, the branches were much thicker and littered among them like barbed wire with thorns. And looking around at the rest of the hedge, thousands and thousands of thorns. Looking closer, I could see centipedes and beetles crawling among the branches, emitting a low hum as they wiggled and crawled. A few of the centipedes, having accidentally impaled themselves onto the thorns, thrashing in unison, causing the hedge to shake. I backed away from it, noticing how all the hedges around me seemed to move, like water in the ocean, in waves, and I realized it was from all the insects populating the hedge. I looked at the base of the roots and saw dead bugs laying on their backs, their millions of legs pointing up towards the blue moon hanging in the nightmare sky. There was no other choice for me but to turn and run. The gravel crunched under my feet and I approached the first fork in the hedge maze. I just let adrenaline guide me and I turned left and then right and then left again. I just kept going and going, feeling the air in my lungs start to burn, until I approached the dead end in the maze and there, standing at the end, was the statue of the man. He stood there in the same pose, arms at his side, head forward, but here on this side, he was free. No branches to keep him rooted. I noticed his eyes move, move to lock onto mine, and I saw him take one step. My heart dropped, and he took another step towards me. I backed away, and then he broke into a dead sprint towards me, face expressionless. I turned and ran back where I'd came from, faster than I'd ran before, struggling not to crash through the hedge at each and every turn I had to make. I could hear the gravel crunching under his feet. For a goddamn statue, he was fast. And I could hear his footfalls gaining ground on my own. If he had been breathing, I'm certain I would have felt it on my neck. I knew he was going to catch me before I could find my way out of the hedge maze. So at that point... I just accepted my fate, and I jumped with as much force as I could possibly muster through the hedge wall. I could feel the thorns pierce my arms, legs, my face, my back, light my skin on fire as I passed through. And then, I was back in my bed, drenched in sweat and panting for breath. I was staring at the ceiling of my bedroom, and my heart was pounding in my ears. I could swear I could still hear his footsteps behind me. It was just a dream though, I told myself. Just a dream born from having one too many cocktails. I was burning up in bed and my skin was itchy and scraggly, as if something was poking me. I needed to get up and take a shower. Throwing the covers off of me and turning on the light, I noticed there were leaves and twigs in my bed, almost completely covering my bed sheets, dirt and grime. I looked down at myself and noticed the centipede crawling up my pyjama pants leg. I screamed and shook it off. It hit the carpet, and before I could stomp it, it skittered underneath my bed. I screamed. I screamed in frustration, in fear, in total exasperation. Head throbbing, I ran into the living room and looked back out the window, looking out at the hedge where the statue had been. I couldn't see if there was anything out there, but I didn't care. I got dressed, I got in my goddamn car, and I went to the closest Walmart I could find and bought as many gallons of herbicide as I could. I got back home, back itching, arms feeling as if they were covered in bug bites, and head pounding, and I pulled the herbicide out of my car and went to work in the backyard. 
the light from the moon being the only thing to illuminate my work of pure hatred. I doused that whole hedge in herbicide, doused the whole thing. After I was done, I took a shower, taking notes of all the markings on my chest and arms and back, and making a mental note to take some allergy medicine later. Then I took another shot of whiskey and shoved the brooms under my mattress and chased the goddamn centipede out from under it, and I stomped a goddamn mud hole into it, not giving a damn about its guts staining my carpet. I just needed it dead. I needed all of it dead. Because once it was dead, it would be under my control. Or at least, I thought it would be. That night, when I went back to sleep, I dreamt that I was back in that hedge maze. I thought everything was okay at first though, because when I approached the hedge, I noticed that it was no longer pulsating with evil life. I could no longer see the insects wriggling around in the branches. Instead, they all appeared to have died and piled among the roots. Looking at the branches themselves, I could see them withering, see them drying up and crack and fall away. And there, in the dying hedge, I could see more statues. Confused, I walked along the maze, seeing how every few feet there was a statue held there by the branches. The statue of a man here, a woman there, a child here. So many statues all along the walls of the hedge maze. And now, the branches were dying. Now, they were crumbling away. I could hear branches crackling, twigs snapping, and looking around, I could see them. I could see the statues moving, brushing away the dead branches, clearing away the restraints, and stepping out into the maze. They didn't even need to run. They were just going to surround me. There was no way out for me. I woke up in a dead sweat that morning, the bug bites lining my arms having turned noticeably stiff. I think I messed up guys. I think I really, really messed up. Have you ever heard of a wiki race? It's a game that I learned in my Digital Studies 101 class first semester of college. Basically, you search for anything on Wikipedia and then try to get to another specific page in as little time and clicks as possible. The catch is that you're only allowed to click on the link within the Wikipedia articles. Say your race started at Toy Story and you wanted to get to the page about piracy off the coast of Somalia. From Toy Story, you'd click on Tom Hanks from there, you'd click on Captain Phillips, and finally, on Pirates. I quickly became obsessed with the degrees of Wikipedia it takes to get from one idea to another. Some were obvious, like elevator to water tank, only having one degree of separation. But I was more interested in the ominous, like the disambiguation page for the name Ella, only having four degrees of separation from Akigahara, the Japanese suicide forest. Most of those paths went through YouTube, thanks to Logan Paul. I quickly became the best in my friend group, and then the best in my classes, and then the best on campus, decided by multiple tournaments that the Digital Studies Department hosted. It's pretty lame, I know, but there's not much else to do in a small town in Virginia. So, I did what I now always turn to when I was bored and out of answers. I searched the wiki. Common forums on wiki races were easy enough to find. The site has been around since 2001 and had grown exponentially ever since. But I wanted more. Thanks to my super geek, super sweet brother, I learned my way around a Tor browser before I graduated high school. I never did anything weird with it, just hopped on a Harry Potter fandom site my bio lab partner showed me in 9th grade. I might have also peaked at LSD prices in 2015 or so, but seriously, nothing worse than that. I double clicked the tiny purple and white icon that I still kept hidden in my applications folder and started searching for games to play. Poor attempts at ARGs were listed everywhere. 
I made a mental note to come back to some of those. But something more interesting caught my eye. It was a simple post by a user named Gottestot, spelt with five T's. I made sure to copy and paste it correctly. All the T's are right. Just two words, or two words and a number I guess. Johnny Gosh, 42621051, Elekchi Lo. I had no idea what any of it meant at first, but the riddle called to me like an open closet door in the middle of a dark bedroom, just beckoning to answer. The first part wasn't hard to figure out. Johnny Gosh was a 12-year-old kid who disappeared in the 80s. Nothing too weird besides the fact that his mother swears he turned back up in 1997 to tell her he was kidnapped by not great people. I was scared for a second that something similar would happen to me, but I had taken all the right precautions. I paid for my VPN and used it constantly, checking it twice whenever I used the Tor browser. Besides, there was nothing that investigating a set of numbers could do to tip off kidnappers. It was that set of numbers that didn't make sense to me. I tried calling the first seven digits, but the answer sounded like a real-world business operation and nothing that would send me down a path of cryptic discovery. So, I immediately hung up. Google only came back with car parts anyway. After about 30 minutes of searching, I decided to give my mind a break while reading up on the initial Wikipedia page covering the Johnny Gosh disappearance. I don't know when exactly this became a way that I used to relax, but it felt nice to immerse myself in something I considered myself good at. It was set up similarly enough to any other biographical Wikipedia page. It amused me that the first hyperlink in the article led to the page outlining what a paperboy was, even before it got into details about when or where he disappeared from. It turns out that intrigue was the key to deciphering that seven digit number. If I counted the number of links on Johnny Gosh's Wikipedia article, the first was for a paperboy, the second was West Des Moines, the third Iowa, and the fourth link took me to an article explaining a concept that I don't feel comfortable including in here, even if it was just an email to myself. I guess look it up if you're that curious, future me. Four links. Four. I thought the number string was designated a Wikipedia path. I split up the rest of the digits logically. Four, two, six, two, ten, five, one. I made the fifth number ten because obviously there couldn't be a zeroth link on a page. If one of the other numbers turned out to be 26 or 51, I would have to figure that out later assuming this logic made sense in the first place. From the page I was currently on, I clicked the second link. Mental disorder. From there, mental health. Well-being. Six-factor model of psychological well-being. Personal development. Self-help. This was starting to sound like a pun of a bad Jordan Peterson joke. So, I had a destination. Self-help. I still wasn't sure what to do with this information. I guess the only thing that seemed like a logical response at the time to me was the reply to Gottestart's post. I decided to get cute with it and copy their signature, just to maximise the chance that they saw it. I made a quick forum account, named myself Sam Alley, then posted simply, Self help, elect Chi Lo. I closed my laptop. I felt both sick and elated after the process. I was proud of getting to an answer, whether or not it was correct. But something still felt wrong. I chalked it up to something I had eaten. I closed my laptop and fell asleep. The next morning, I would nearly forgotten about my endeavour. When I came to class the next day, my professor seemed stunned. You're alive! he exclaimed. He was unusually overenthusiastic about students coming to class. It was a small seminar, so any missing person stifled the conversation, but the thing was, I never missed a class. Participation was a huge part of our grade, and the class itself was worth double credits because it was held every day of the week. I hadn't felt sick at all 
after I got a 24 hour long bug a month ago. I just smiled and brushed it off as him being forgetful. Even people with PhDs make simple social mistakes. Except, he wasn't the only one surprised to see me. Multiple friends made an effort to ask me if I was okay, or if I needed to talk to them about something. I finally broke. What are you talking about? I'm totally fine. I told the group of friends from my digital studies major classes that I was eating lunch with. Then, where were you yesterday? Here, I responded, skeptically. I thought it was a prank. No, you weren't. I tried texting, calling, and coming by your room, but you never answered. Yes, I was. Getting frustrated. We went to bingo last night. Bingo was Tuesday. Yesterday was Wednesday. I paused, convinced they were messing with me. A final, shut up, followed by a small laugh coming only from me, ended the conversation. Everyone ate in silence. Was I crazy? How could I have just been missing an entire day of my life? The elaborate prank theory was thrown out once I checked my phone and realized it was in fact Thursday. It just begged the question, where did my Wednesday go? I went through Gottesdott's gauntlets as often as they were given. It was the same number string every time. Four, two, six, two, one, zero, five, one. Toynbee tiles to lumber. Sacred geometry to the London Bridge. Shanda Sherrod to physics. Search. Click. 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 Copy. Paste. Repeat. That was my process every time. And every time I finished, I was greeted by a large sense of pride and a small sense of sickness. Nothing alarming, but just a reminder that I'm still human, no matter how good I am at internet metagames. Other forum users started getting annoyed at our call and response, but the issue was fixed quick enough. Got to start, just started sending my starting points through every method imaginable. IM, email, text, letter, mirror steam, trunk tree carving, even the bottom of my salad bar contained the beginnings of my new favourite game. I was so excited to get a new assignment that the unusual logistics my game master would have had to go through to get these to me never crossed my mind until I was too addicted to care. I knew they were for me though, because Elect Chi Lo was nearby every time, as was my new favourite eight digit number. Four, two, six, two, one, zero, five, one. I was getting so fast that counting links became second nature to me. I thought I would start ignoring the actual text on all of the Wikipedia pages that I was visiting, but the opposite actually happened. My reading and processing became faster with each click. I was absorbing so much information, I could almost feel it entering my skin. My hairs would stand up and my eardrums would tingle, as if I was listening to ASMR. The feeling would elate more and more as I got closer to the final page. I stopped double-checking my work, and I don't even think God to start was even reading my answers to see if I got it right. I posted, he gave me a new one. Rinse and repeat. The information was fascinating. It was unlike anything I had ever studied before, and it was so applicable to what I was working towards. It felt like a game in of itself, because this information was scattered all over Wikipedia. Instead of being organized in any one place, bits and pieces were hidden in other articles. It was a game inside of a game, and I was getting very good at it. The gist of my findings is that there are certain articles in Wikipedia that can't be linked from anywhere else, they're called orphan pages. That's obviously not the interesting part. Certain groups have become interested in the hiding in plain sight aspect of Wikipedia. Crime families would hide hitman contracts inside of the Wikipedia pages of their targets. How they got past the army of editors is beyond me. But it wasn't just mobsters. 
Certain cults have started to use the platform as a way of preserving and disseminating information about who or what they worship. The cult of Cecil was the most common recurring example. Cecil was the name of the blind god, called by many names across cultures. Hodur, Samael, Yalbadoth, Azathoth. The modern worshippers just called him Cecil as the way to hide through modernization. According to various unverifiable paragraphs scattered throughout Wikipedia, the cult of Cecil was so comprehensive in their uploading of tomes, myths, and rites that the very essence of Cecil has been infused into the pages of Wikipedia. Obviously, they don't want just anyone to stumble on a digitized version of their destructive deity, so they scrub the rest of the website to ensure that only priests have access to these pages. Orphan pages for a blind god. I had just finished the quick got to start race as a way to relax after working on a semester end project when I suddenly smelled a putrid stench. It was a sewer crossed with rotten eggs and it engulfed everything in my room. I searched all over for a source, but neither under my bed nor in my fridge contained anything out of the ordinary. It was only after standing up from my squat in front of said fridge that I realized where it was coming from. It was me. My hair was almost as frizzy as it was greasy, swaying in one place only due to how caked and grime it was. My shirt collar smelled like fermented fish or a dirty retainer, and the armpit had deodorant stains thicker than my fingernails. Those were covered in grime too, for the record. My underwear was... soiled. And everything stunk. Terribly. I was almost too confused to be embarrassed by the whole thing. The stairs and dry heaves that I got from my floor mates on my way to the dorm bathroom made sure to rectify that. When I got out, I still got the stairs, but they were closer to wonder than disgust. I didn't know anybody around well enough to ask what the big deal was. The back of my mind already pieced together the likely explanation, even though I couldn't believe it. How long was I gone? I asked my clearly worried friends as soon as they processed that I was back. A week maybe? Give or take two days? We all thought you went back home after your last episode. I swear I was here the whole time. I really don't remember anything after Wednesday when I was working my homework in my room. You mean you were just sitting in your room for eight days? No food? No water? No bathroom? Yeah, I think so. That's impossible, though. They all insisted that I go see someone, get hypnotized, get on meds, do anything to make me remember what happened in the last hundred hours of my life. The idea absolutely disgusted me, though. I wanted, and still want, nobody inside my head. It was my space to do with as I please. If that involves weeks of research on new topics for Gottesdott, then so be it. That made me remember. The race. Was that the thing that was making me lose it? My time? My sanity? My cleanliness? I pushed it aside. These investigations were making me smarter, not dumber. There was no time before discovering Gottesdott's game that I felt as good as I do now. The skill I was developing made me feel alive. There was no way I was going to give that up. That day was the last time I saw my friends from school. Most of my time is devoted to the games now. I'm more cautious to eat, drink and pee regularly as to not cause another stink episode and draw attention to me. It would just be a bigger distraction down the line that would get in the way of everything. Euthanasia to the Jason Mraz album No. The Zodiac Killer to Latin, Disambiguation. Carl P. Schmidt to the provinces and territories of Canada. My list continued to grow and grow, as did my knowledge of the cult of Cecil. I felt as if I knew Cecil myself, an interpreter of his essences hidden from me and me alone to find. Still, every time I finished the race, 
I felt both extremely happy, but slightly sick. Like I had cheated somehow, I was feeling guilty from victory. The sickness half of it was slowly dying down, as if more and more races were my medication. All while the triumphant feeling of successful runs kept me coming back for more. I was given one final clue from who I now considered to be my closest friend. The one who guided me to learn far more than anyone could possibly teach me outside of my dorm room and inside the walls of the real university. I don't know how much time I'd spent alone in my room, but I did know that I had matured a lot. I no longer had an appetite for what little food I had left in my desk drawers. My feet and back would ache whenever I forced myself to move to the restroom down the hall. Nobody was around to greet me anymore either. All signs that, to me, showed that I was pointed in the right direction, away from the outside and towards my prizes. My new starting point was different, slightly unclear. My name, 42621051, Cecil. I wish I could stay humble and pretend that his clue intimidated me or made me question my methods up to this point. It instead just validated how good I had actually gotten. I had suspected it for a while. Got to start didn't have extra T's. It was missing spaces. Gott ist tot is the original German translation of Nietzsche's declaration that God is dead. The silence that followed my quick realization was deafening. If the game was making time go by faster before, it became a total crawl now. My breaths were calculated and measured, the movement on my trackpad even more so. What remained of my hunger and thirst were gone now. I knew it was time for me to ascend, as I had read so much about. Time for me to finally see as Cecil does, without eyes, but seeing everything. Everything else I had learned up to this point was so useless because it didn't allow me to actually see. Click. Philosophy. Everything I worked for was for this very moment. The ecstasy was unlike anything I had ever felt before. Not only was I good at something, but I was finally being rewarded for it. All my hard work, paying off and being recognized by the blind god. Click. Greek language. I almost felt pity for all of my friends who ignored me. It wasn't until just now that I realized I hadn't heard from them since my stupid sawing incident. I wasn't bothered since everything I needed was right here in front of me, but it was interesting to take notice of. Click. Modern Greek. Nearly all physical sensations were gone. Cravings for food or drink no longer tied me down, wasted my time, made me human. I could go anywhere and do anything, but there was nothing I wanted to do except play with Cecil. All of it was a distraction, a necessary input to keep myself going towards the inevitable end. I've transcended that now. Click. Greek language. These double backs happen all the time with Cecil's games. When I was younger and just starting out, this kind of thing made me fear that I was somehow incorrect. Obviously, there can be circular loops in Wikipedia, but it made it seem like my progress was stalled. I now saw differently, proving that my sight before Cecil was never enough. Recognizing my clear improvement, I moved on. Click. Cyprus. I was ancient. Time hasn't meant much to me since I left my friends, my school, my physical form. It felt as if my first game was just a few days ago, but also that centuries of experience and worship have gotten me to where I am now. I am not ancient now. I am simply eternal, and my time for apotheosis has come. Cyprus. The final word. The page containing everything I needed to know for ascension was disguised as a simple list of trees. The idea made me giggle, and then laugh, and then fall over myself hysterical. How clever Cecil is! 
hiding the most powerful orphanage page behind a link containing a novice park ranger guidebook. It took me a while to get back on my feet and compose myself. The pain was sharp and excruciating, but simultaneously far away from my actual body, as if I could feel someone else's pain on the other side of my room. Click. I read the page. I read everything. It all went so fast, but I read it so deliberatively. Life, love, power. All of it spelled out so simply on a black and white web page. I felt nothing now. I became the words on the screen as I read them. All of Cecil's secrets about him and about us spilling out. The last sound I perceived was a low boom followed by scraping metal along my linoleum floor. What followed wasn't quite silence, but the total absence of sound altogether. How could you describe the color blue to someone who is colorblind? My apotheosis has finished, and the good word of Cecil must be spread. I'll see you soon. The following writings were taken from missing person Ella Ames' email address. It appears she emailed them to herself as a form of digital diary. We are reaching out to see if anyone has any information regarding her disappearance. She is likely missing an eyeball, as one with a needle protruding from the pupil was an object of interest recovered from a dorm room. If anyone has any information about this symbol, or the whereabouts of Ella, please contact us as soon as possible. Thank you.